We got new merch, some new colorways uh, in the Be Good to Yourself collection. We've got hoodies in plum and moss. We've also got t-shirts in lilac, moss, and blue mist. I hope you enjoy those. Those are good colors. Get that hitter and more at theovonstore.com. I'd also like to announce some new tour dates. I will be coming with the Return of the Rat Tour, January 26th to Louisville, Kentucky. January 28th, Indianapolis. February 2nd, Shreveport, Louisiana. February 4th, Baton Rouge. March 24, Corpus Christi. March 25, Houston, Texas. April 26th, Phoenix, down there in the sun. May 13th, New York City. Uh, and June 1st, Austin, Texas. All those uh, shows go on sale Wednesday, November 16th at 10 a.m. local time with the code RATKING. That's the pre-sale. Um, you can get any ticket through theovon.com slash T-O-U-R. Uh, just make sure you go through there to get accurately priced seats. And uh, thank you guys, and we love you. Today's guest, um, I mean, this guy, he's got more voices in him than a dang schizophrenic, you know? He's a real, uh, you know, he just, his impersonations and his ability to imagine and create at the same time, it's, uh, it's a remarkable gift to the world. And, um, and we've seen it through uh, his work on Saturday Night Live, uh, his countless films, um, Wayne's World, his new podcast, uh, Fly on the Wall with David Spade, and his new scripted podcast with Dex Carvey and Julian Matulich. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about that today. Uh, I'm grateful to get to spend time with him, Mr. Dana Carvey. Shine that Well, the worst thing you can do is say to yourself, I wonder if I'll get an erection. Yeah. <laughs> the whole idea of sex is not thinking. And oh, all you impossible. have to do is concentrate on turning yourself on. Because they asked me that once on a podcast. They go, how do you turn someone else, so, turn someone on? You go, turn yourself on. Damn. True. Focus on that. Yeah, I think I, I like, yeah, I mean, I've had probably libido issues since I was probably, I would bet eight or nine months old. I don't know. Well, but you're, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, like, I don't know when well, you don't libido's. have a libido until you go through puberty, really, right? Okay. I mean, did you, who has a libido when they're in diapers? I mean, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, you know. I don't know. Yeah. I have to look at some pictures and see what, you know, see what was going on back then. But, yeah, I felt like. I don't know when that libido starts cranking up. Well, it's normally, I'll just play doctor, uh, when puberty happens is when libido kicks up. I'm gonna say that, yeah. We had a party in our neighborhood. This guy, had he was an Elvis impersonator, right? Mm -hmm. And he had a party for his child whenever he went through puberty, I remember. And we went over Well, that's kind of like a bar mitzvah, kind of, right? I guess. I don't know. I'd never, I'd never been anything like that. I think it was like some part of, I don't know if it was like a church program or whatever, but mm -hmm. yeah, this fella got all pubescent or whatever. And so they invited pubescent. everybody over there for cake or whatever. <laughs> when I turned 13, my dad headbutt me and I saw stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You think you're a man? <laughs> 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 that's a, but enough that's about a the girl mitzvah, dude. That's the same thing, bro. I tell everybody, Mike Myers always said the one movie movie had was a headbutt, and you always come up slow. If you know there's gonna be a fight, like what's up? We gotta have peace. Boom, and yeah. you really is efficient. Yeah. Didn't you have that in Louisiana? A headbutt? move headbutts, the sudden friendly <laughs> one. I don't know, Jed. We should get along. Yeah. We can share the fishing hole. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm just. I don't know where you grew up. I know it's down in that area of the world. Yeah, I think if a good headbutt. What was a good move? A good headbutt. Oh, Mace. Yeah. I think was popular by us. 
Are you a little warm, Dana? Well, no, I'm not. Well, this this is for Arctic weather, but I just want to keep the blue around me because it's hip. Yeah, it is. I'm like in nice, a little man. cozy. Yeah, I can't believe how good I look today. Yeah, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, isn't well, it interesting? Some days you crack up, you wake up, and you're like, okay, today's going to be an okay looking day. <laughs> I know. Well, if I go back. I, I still think that a man, Lorne Michael said once, something about a man in his 40s and a woman in their 20s. They're both at the peak of their power. Ooh. So you're just coming into your peak sex symbol. You're successful. You're in your 40s. Now you go start to look at 20, 21, 20, 22. I'll keep going. 23, <laughs> keep going 24. More. But yeah, you're in, you're in your prime. But I remember someone saying that to me. I had this like, guy my age doing my hair on some kind of movie. And he goes, and I go, oh, I'm 38, you know? And he goes, oh, you're in your prime. Oh. That fucker was right. Was he? No, but I'm in my prime now. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, the prime, I guess. <laughs> Hi, keep, I'm Johnny Positive. <laughs> yeah, the prime has to keep moving, huh? Uh, you have to keep the prime moving, don't you? The Yeah. If you if you didn't age or get older, then I, we'd be in some kind of hellish environment. You, you know? think? Yeah, we got to check out. We got to have an expiration date. It, it makes everything intense. What if you lived a million years? You just you just like what would you do? <laughs> it's like I mean, you would definitely probably call in. You know, you call you'd show up late to work more. I think. <laughs> you. Well, you know, I have always wanted to play the saxophone because my parents, I got picked to play the saxophone in fifth grade, but it was seven dollars a month, and oh. I kept coming to school. It's expensive, huh? And they said, they said, "Where's your saxophone?" So I go, "I'll, I'll have it tomorrow." Yeah. And then at one point. I think my mom said, you know, we, we can't afford the saxophone. So if I lived a million years, I would spend at least 10,000 years practicing the saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> Bro, yeah. you'd be so good then. <laughs> you'd be able to play for the king or I don't whatever. Think I, no, I don't think that's my skill set. But I like to bang on things and strum things. Did you, you have know? a uh, instrument as a child? Was there something you got kind of early that they gave you? Usually a, a parent will give a child something, give them a horn, give them a little, uh, you know, sometimes you see people parents right. give them a Moroccan. That whatever. came later. But first, my brother and I saw the Beach Boys. We had a band called The Surfers. So we had the clothes hamper and you know, with a crayon we wrote the surfers he got a one string guitar he could play louis louis for a buck mm -hmm. and i would kick the clothes hamper for my kick drum and then i had a hardy boys book for my snare and the two drumsticks we stole from mickey hart of the grateful dead oh, his wow. store in the 1960s because we were huge juvenile delinquents yeah. and then i met him 30 years later and i didn't know if it was true he goes did you own a music store on laurel avenue in san carlos he goes yeah I go, I think I shoplifted there. I handed him a 20. But I had that. And then I got a big bash snare drum in sixth grade. Mm. Plastic. But I had a muscly cousin who came down and just beat, uh, killed it in a day. And why did he do it? He just was angry that you were going to try no, to learn it? He was one of those muscly kids. He's like a sixth grader, Jay Winters. And he just was muscly. Every, yeah. You visited him. Every time you visited him, he'd crouch like he was going to wrestle you. Yeah. You know, one of those cousins. Like, yeah. I don't want to wrestle you, dude. So he broke the big bash. Whoa. But do you do you remember what, what toy blew your mind? Because I always ask people this. I This is what I say, the big three mm -hmm. from five to 12. All right. Movie or TV show where you went, holy shit. Toy you had where you went, holy shit. And then a bike where you felt like an adventurer. The oh. bike, you know. Yeah, I think the bike was, uh, it had those spoke things, those little dinks, those little dinks. Whenever the wheel turned, like the yeah. little thing would slide down the little, it had like a little, a little, you know, a thing that they used to count if you can't count real good and you slide it. Oh, okay. So it had like a little ticker thing. Go t -t 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 -t. Yeah, yeah. Something mm -hmm. like a little, like these little, can you pull it up, Zach? Abacus? No, can you pull up what I'm talking about? Just like the the because we would do a clothespin and playing cards Ooh, to get the motor sound. That's fine. You did that too, right? Yeah, they, they yeah we got upsold some garbage little deal, but it would tink, and then this hot girl sometimes would ride on it with me, you know, or not that hot, but like you know she like lived near me, which was hot back then, you know. Oh, yeah, oh. dude, if a girl lived far, and if you could throw something and hit a girl, damn, she was fine, wasn't she? <laughs> when uh, you were growing up, I would say third grade. Yeah, did you ever drop your pencil? So you had to pick it up, and then you look behind you, and the girl you could see the girl's skirt. Oh, drop it so she would get it? No, drop it so you have an excuse to reach down and look back where oh, the girl you sure. liked was sitting. Yeah. Dude, I was erect from probably 
wait a minute, you had no libido. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I did it. I might have been all libido. But I was erect yeah. probably uh, from, yeah, I can't even imagine. I think from probably fifth grade to probably 31. I did you just, ever have it like in grade school, like, okay, and you're just f full bloom, you're oh. just fantasizing, you're in a zone, you're not paying attention, they go, Theo, come to the chalkboard. Yeah. Come to the chalkboard right now. Yeah, you're like, and I'll, you had a full erection. Did uh, you, did, what did you do about that? <laughs> joust. I would joust the other guy passing me in the aisle. <laughs> That's what I would do. Everybody was erect, man. It was just a the bunch whole of, classroom. <laughs> oh, it was a bunch of like those tarpons passing each other in the water <laughs> in in, in, uh, in middle school and oh, junior great, high. Man. Every like, I feel like you just didn't want to get snagged on. <laughs> somebody's freaking <laughs> pants snout when you're walking down the hall i remember sometimes i would have my strap hanging off my bag and we had hooked on somebody else's penis as you're just you know because in, in junior <laughs> high every kid is just so damn erect bro uh, it's just like you you know people just they can't handle it you know you get that front rudder on you and you can't handle it as a child but i remember this <laughs> hot girl got her toe caught in my bike yeah we had to take her to the like I don't know if it was an emergency room or just mm -hmm. just somebody close by that had damn thread on them, you know, and we took her over there. And uh, I damn, remember- Damn thread? You mean just cool clothes? Oh, uh, no, like just like could knit, knit her, oh. you know, spruce, splice her toe back up. Oh. And so uh, I remember she got, man, she got- she got pretty mangled up, and but she had a limp after that, and I would I'd limp with her because she was always trying to run away from me. So after that, it was kind of good because it kind of, you know, gave me a chance to so talk So she's to out in some open field in Louisiana and she's got this hickety step because of oh, a broken yeah. leg and you're kind of chasing her no, and she's trying to get away. Originally, she'd keep away from me, but once she got her toe, yeah. she rode on my bike one time, she got yeah. her toe caught yeah. in the spokes. And that was, and that's and what it slowed caused her down. permanent damage? Or? Mm, it caused at least maybe two months of damage. Wow. Okay. God, nice. Well, my brother lost his front teeth two different ways. In fifth grade, Damn. I think. First, he did a wheelie on his Stingray. Front tire went boom, chip. They got the caps. Then he's doing Duncan yo-yos, and he's going loop to loop. Bam, oh, chipped him again. Yeah, <laughs> Only twice. I thought there'd be a third one, man. It'll but happen still. Duncan Imperials. I once shoplifted six of those at a Woolworths. I would go to kids on the street and go, you want a yo-yo? And I'd go in, steal a yo-yo, bring it out. You want one, Duncan Imperial? Go in, take it. Yeah. I was juvenile in were fourth you? grade. Yeah. And what were you think you were acting out about something? I'm sitting here with Dana Carvey as well. And I'm sorry, I no. didn't even introduce that. Not at all. And what is that? Is oh, Dana they, short for something? Dana? No, my name was Brett on the birth certificate. My mm. grandmother, because I had three older brothers, we were all stacked tight, five kids in 10 years, my mom. Um, and my grandmother said, they're going to call him Brett the Brat. So I think Dana Andrews was a movie star at the time. I think it came from that. But it was, I got in girls peas classes in high school like the thing would come report to the girls physical education class because and you'd name. show up yeah theo is definitely a man's name but dana's a switch hitter like dana. chris or robin yeah robin was a wild one huh? dana but yeah that must have been nice i was thinking yeah could it be short for <clears throat> something maybe maybe bandana i could see <laughs> uh they call me dane the brain because my two of my brothers were dyslexic so they got c's if they really tried so I got a few Bs, and then I was my nickname was Dane the Brain. Oh yeah, if you were that's kind of funny. If you're even smarter than your brother, you get classified as the Brain, even if all y'all are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not y'all, but I'm just saying. No, just in any family, you know, like this is our smart kid. You know, we get Cs. You're well, like, it was oh, it was damn. it was bad for dyslexic kids in those days because they just put you in the the yellow book or the red reading book. Oh. Then there was the green, pretty smart. We got in the blue yeah. book, we were the rock stars, and then they would send us to the speed reading, kind of clockwork orange van, and they would do the <laughs> words like that, reading a thousand <laughs> words a minute. So that was, you know, it was a weird childhood. But I, my brothers were, we were all shoppers, uh, shoplifters and smokers. Yeah. We would steal my mom's Kent cigarettes and just wail on those. Then we would eat ice plants so no one would smell it on our breath. And one day we went to the mall and we, three of us, me and my two older brothers, we parked our bikes, said, shit, someone's going to steal them. We went into a hardware store, stole locks, locked up our bikes, <laughs> went back in, shoplifted, came home, laid everything out on a table. My brother Brad, who I based Garth on, a science brother, he added it all up and he goes, that's $14 and about 92 cents of stuff in those days. So that, so therefore we said 1492, it's like Columbus. 
So when you were shoplifting with your brother, you'd go, are you sailing the blue? And he goes, yeah, I'm sailing the blue. I'm trying to get, you know. And my brother Brad eventually uh, would steal for the sport of it. Like, like he'd go and get a whole LP album under his shirt. Ooh. And I'd go up, you see it, sailing the blue? And he goes, check it out. I could, I could take it if I want. I could take it because he talked like that. Mm -hmm. And then he would put it back. Ooh. So he was like a catch and release shoplifter. Wow, you don't see a lot of that. No, just for sport, just for, but he was a brilliant kid. I mean, we would go to Battle Creek, Michigan to get something from Kellogg's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the cereal. So you, you'd, you'd have to put a quarter in the envelope. And he would just, he tore a little part of the envelope open to see if they go, oh, poor kid, it, if someone t tore it. And he would get the prize. Oh. Or if we wanted to buy candy at the mercantile, when we went to the lake, he would have a, he would sort of take a, piece of metal and make a slug out of it and put a quarter on top so the guy would think it was 50 cents mm. so he was a clever kid dang he yeah. was real clever huh? it sounds like he's very have that ocean's 11 in him you know like he's got that yeah uh and did he end up getting in any any real crime no he just he became he became a brilliant engineer he invented mm. the first sort of sort of uh online or sorry computer video home thing it was called the video toaster mm. with tim jennison in the 90s and he was a kid who um, had D cell batteries. I found a frog one day and I gave it, I thought it was dead, you know, and he kind of hooked it up and it was sort of vibrating because he, he had these two D cells and he sort of wired it up on it. And I thought it was kind of eye was opening. And uh, I said, Brad, the eye's opening. And this is a true story. I do it in my act, but he's like, cars. He goes, Yeah, I brought him back to life. He'll never die again. So that was a. <laughs> <laughs> but Scott and I, so he was the one, the bunk bed one. And we were- Because we y'all shared, y'all had a room with how many bunk beds in it? The downstairs brothers that were weird, even to this day, they had a bunk bed downstairs. And Mark, was two brothers. Two brothers and me and Scott up there, Mark and Brad. And Mark would wet the bed like yeah. anybody's business. So my parents got this machine in a catalog. So it'd be like this plastic sheet and a little mechanical thing to would wake him up when he'd start to wet the bed. Yeah. So he started to wet one night, but he wet so much he, he killed the machine. Mm. And that would rain down on Brad because yeah. he was the lower bunk, yeah. but he was inventing all kinds of stuff. But And then Scott and I, we were upstairs and uh, he would sleep with the covers over, but we was a rough and tumble second day baked goods. You know, you go to the, my mom would go yep. to the bakery, one day old, two, too expensive, two day old, they're almost giving it away. Yeah. So we put those in a freezer. My dad would buy a side of cheap, cheap beef mm. and he would put it in this freezer and then we'd get it and it was almost all gristle. Yeah. It goes, oh, Jesus Christ, the best part's a gristle. And it was just like gnarly steak. Oh. So I had a blocked artery by the time I was your age. Yeah. Yeah, 100% yeah. blocked, man. <laughs> it was really blocked. <laughs> there was so much fight. I, I think like, there was so much more mystery and stuff, it seems like. When you look at, like, your childhood, right? Yeah. And then you have children now. How many children do you have? Two. Okay, and you have two male children. That I know of, sir. Right, and so y'all are male heavy. Y'all seed line is male heavy. Yeah, basically. They're my younger sister, my mom had four boys. I've had two boys. Yeah, so a lot of... You know, I think of masculinity begats masculinity. No, yeah. that's a joke. <laughs> no, I'm just saying it's almost like a damn gay nightclub at this point. I mean, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of men in it is all I'm saying, dude. But well, Why is it a gay nightclub? Well, I mean, you're going to have a lot of men over there, you know? Well, I'm just saying Jeffrey Dahmer would buy y'all a couple sandwiches. You know? like, <laughs> well, there was a lot of wrestling. So my dad, first of all, he loved to grow a scratchy beard mm -hmm. and then you go oh jesus christ time for the whiskers and you were like five years old you weigh like 40 pounds ah and he would get on top of you and he go whiskers and he would just rub his face on your face like ah ah <laughs> and then he'd have me oh jesus christ fight him so i had to fight my brother scott who seemed yeah. like a giant compared to me he was 12 i was 10 and he'd go oh grab his balls he would scream at us your dad would? oh jesus christ grab his balls <laughs> so that was <laughs> these are these are good times Theo. Oh yeah, but I know <laughs> I I I had a Disney face when I was your age, so people always used to think, "What a what a mellow, easy, happy life you've had." But it was it was good that we had each other, right? You know? And so it we, sounds like it sounds like y'all were really close, huh? We are we are still now. We survived it. It was a fascinating time. It was you know. 
But um, you look back on your childhood pretty fondly. It sounds like you look back on because you have so many like memories. I love. I, I'm like kind of fascinated by nostalgia and stuff. So I think I think about those times a lot. You know. Well, I think that those years you can't ever get back, and those years are precious. The thing that we were able to do is we were so independent. There was one landline. It was a party line. Sometimes you pick it up and the neighbors are using yeah, it. Oh, sorry. That, huh? Yeah. So you were just gone a lot. Yeah. And my dad would go to Montana with his friends a lot. And so we would be just on our own and just on get on your Schwinn Stingray. My brother got the Schwinn Monster Green. My parents ran out of money. They got me the Sears offload or whatever it was it was a cheap kickoff yeah. one which i knew it was okay but the step kid or whatever the bike was even called i think i, yeah, I think so <laughs> the, the other no, the, scott was the favorite so we uh we just ride around all day and we just you know i played flag football in yeah. fifth grade and it seemed like professional sports yeah i loved it. it ready break and i was the halfback and you know so i agree with you that's why i call them the seminal years i think they're so important to about 12 then that then then life kind of interrupts but before that you're taking in so much information you know what about you yeah you, i mean we had a at, decent you time at seven or eight what, what's going on in your household <clears throat> are you scared dude i was very scared growing up i think i think i just yeah. grew up like real sensitive like super sensitive real scared mm. um what what was it like i think uh yeah, it's a lot of time alone, a lot of time with strange babysitters, you know. Mm -hmm. We had a babysitter that got a roach in her ear one night, and she kept, like, yelling at us <laughs> that she had a roach in her ear. But she spoke also Spanish or something. Or, I don't know if she spoke Spanish or just something was, like, wrong with her or something. Or she didn't – maybe she didn't speak real well or something, but we thought it was Spanish, you know. How, yeah, babysitters are memorable. We had one when I was five. My parents drove to Montana. And so, you lived in Montana growing up? No, just till mm -hmm. age five. But we went okay. there every summer. I was just there. So I'm, okay. I'm, I'm a native son in a sense. But that babysitter, like I'm five and I got, a, she's putting back teen and a Band-Aid on my knee. Mm. And I'm five and I'm remembering her years later, like she was a fairy princess, like gorgeous. So I mm. said to my brothers at the time, Mark was like 12 and he goes, oh yes, she was just a complete knockout. Wow. But that's that was a memory when I was five. But oh, I wasn't yeah. thinking sexually, I just thought, it just hit my brain, you know? You know, I've lost some of my hair. Um, I wasn't taking care of myself, and I got off of medications uh, that help you keep your hair, and damn, a third of it fell out. So that's what's happening in the world. You know, two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they are 35. Uh, more than 50 million men in the U.S. suffer from male pattern baldness. One thing you can do is what I'm back doing now is using Keeps. Keeps offers a simple, affordable, and stress-free way to keep your hair. I'm not worried anymore. I know I'm back on the right path. Convenient virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door every three months. You don't have to leave your home. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, Go to K-E-E-P-S dot com slash Theo to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash T-H-E-O to get your first month free. Keeps dot com slash Theo. This holiday season, the best deal in wireless can only be found at Mint Mobile. Right now, when you switch to Mint Mobile and buy any three-month plan, you get another three months for free. That's right. All plans come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. For a limited time only, buy any three-month Mint Mobile plan and get three more months free by going to mintmobile.com slash Theo. That's mintmobile.com slash Theo. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash Theo. Yeah, there so was babysitters were oh babysitters were good, but ours was yeah. This one lady, she was either Spanish or or just I don't know if she had like she might have just had like um, fuck she could have been damn narcoleptic. I don't remember what she was. She, there was something unique about her to us, you know. Yeah. Um, huh. and she um, she got a roach in her ear, and she was trying to tell us, and we're just kids, you know. I remember, and she's like yelling in Spanish about a roach having like a, a el curcaracha in um. 
I don't know what they call and it. And she's scr- yelling at the kids. How and, us, and we don't know. We don't know what's going on. We, you know, we don't know if it's like charades. I remember we I barely know. knew her, you know, and then uh, she ended up having to go to the hospital and she did. A roach had got into her ear. God, that's and, funny because uh, that's such a great yeah. word for that accent because I remember Al Pacino doing a Cuban accent. You cockroach. A cockroach is a, a great word. A cockroach. A cockroach. A tire. In Tair, yeah. In Tair, a cockroach. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, am I canceled? I can't do that no, accent. you're good, dude. A cockroach. Um, so, yeah. So, th- I just for a second, because- My father was Nicaraguan also. So, you're so, good to do that here. So, he had a full accent and everything? He had probably, I would say, 40% accent. So, you, know? you would say, you know, I don't, I don't know the difference. I just know a general, I just know Al Pacino's crazy Cuban the accent. Cockroach. So, Theo, yeah. why are you going to do Theo? It's time for Thanksgiving dinner, Theo. Is that how he said it? No, he didn't. He didn't say Not it. that much. He was a little lighter, you know? Hey, Theo. Yeah. Hey, Theo. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what did he think of you, you think? Like, my dad had it in for me a little bit. He did was he, was little... he jealous of you, you think? Yeah. He was jealous that you were kind of like pri- like funny and fun? He didn't think I was funny. I think my brother Brad could fix things. Like, oh, you know, our tool drawer was really sucked. Like, the hammer always was lost. So Brad would take a butter knife and fix the dryer. Mm. And my dad would stand over him and then try to take credit for it. He was just insecure about not being able to do that. Uh-oh. And then for me, is because my mom called me precious. Mm. I look kind of androgynous. I don't know what he thought I was. But, yeah, I could see it a little. And he was, oh, I definitely had a very much a baby face. And he had it in for him. But what did your dad think of you? Were you the favorite son? or you, there were, How many brothers? I had one brother and two sisters. Okay. And my dad was born in 1910, so he was an old man, right? So, so by the time you were like eight or 10, he was almost 80 then. Yeah, he was almost 80. When I was 10, he was 80. And so mm-hmm. it was interesting. I don't think I knew what he thought of him. You know, he would be sleeping a lot. Like a lot of my memories are my mom waking him up and him being kind of pissed off about stuff. Or he'd be sitting somewhere and he would just kind of doze off. You know, he liked to let me sometimes mm-hmm. like rub on his shoulders a little bit. Um, sometimes he would smell like beer. Um he let me like drive his car whenever I could like was tall enough to drive. Like he kind of like let me just, hmm. he needed help, you know, a little bit. So it was like kind of like this trade off a little, but what did he think? He thought well, he's got three other kids. Yeah. I mean, in, in between him and your mom, I mean, who, what, was there anyone who was the clear cut favorite or I was my mom's favorite mm, and were? Scott was my dad's favorite. Cause all of a sudden you'd come home and he has a new guitar. Mm. We're like it's not even Christmas or his birthday. Fuck, that that's like, way unfair. Oh man, but I I was not envious of it to be to be Bud's favorite. No, yeah. I didn't. I just got didn't. You know that was great. Get away from the monster. But I thought he's just getting toys. He was called Scotchman or Scott the Pot. Oh, he got it. Did you have a nickname, Theo the Leo? No, I think I just had like <laughs> Theo. So, uh, what is it, Teddy? Maybe sometimes. But. Did they so? Why did they name you Theo? It's such a unique name, isn't it? For that your generation? Yeah, my I dad's hip, name but... was the- Teodor- Teodoro. Oh, Teodoro. Was name. Yeah. Oh. So we had that, Spain, you know, like some type of uh, Spanish flair or something, you know? Teodoro. Teodoro. Oh. Teodoro mm. Roosevelt. Yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah. named my son, so he become a president. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> Is it offensive? No. Teodoro Roosevelt. I think it's good. I used to think you must have been such a cool kid because you have such a curious brain. So I I hope that you're, what about your mom? Didn't they I kinda... think they didn't, my mom was busy working. So we had these strange people that'd be over there, you know, a lot of these babysitters, and we'd make up stories and tell them stuff you know and <laughs> a lot of them we'd have like it was the first we'd have like this big black lady that would take care of us or a very old woman that would take care of us and just like we had the spanish lady with the roach in her you know like so there was just <laughs> like i think we didn't really know who was gonna be there one time we did get the hot chick dude and i remember she took me to summer camp or day camp at the ymca mm-hmm. And she drove this orange car, I don't remember, and she played Bon Jovi, and I just remember. I don't think I'd ever heard music until there was like a hot woman preg- pre- uh, present. Uh, oh, yeah. And suddenly, like, I could hear music. I was cool. And I was like, play it again, play it again. And, like, just, like, her, like, interacting with me or engaging with me was, like, the most magical thing I remember. And then... um Mm. Yeah, and she was not even cute, I don't think, but I thought she was like just the hottest thing ever, you know. Oh, there, you know, she looked like a man actually. She was almost like a man. She looked. She had like a short haircut, <laughs> and she, 
she kind of, I think she kind of, I think a lot of dudes would have been like, whoa, you know, mm. she's not my first choice of a woman, you know? <laughs> that I had Plus. crushes. I had just mad crushes with yeah. absolute shyness. Uh, Linda Benson. There mm. was like a she had some tits, huh? seventh grade party and you do a makeout session, you know, in oh. the dark. And it was Linda Benson. And she knew, it, knew her way around that situation. But I went, what did they do? They put y'all in a closet or something? It was just a dark room. And I, you know, seventh grade and like, what? And suddenly you're, yeah, maybe we went in a closet. Yeah. I don't know. But, uh, and I, what happened? Is it like the hardest part ever was, I think, trying to touch a breast or something? And at the movies, a lot of guys, there'd be big guys, be like, touch it, get that titty, boy. <laughs> and they threaten you if you didn't do it, you know? So then you're like working off of a clock, kind of as like a shot clock. Well, the thing is, is that there were, I don't know where you were. In junior high, there's some women that go, Beep. right, they come back from the summertime. And they've been genetically gifted. They're suddenly stunning. Mm. Some of the guys, we had a guy who's like had a little beard. He was all muscly. He was in eighth grade. And I looked like a fetus with shoes. Ooh. I mean, I was nothing Ooh. was happening. But I, you know, I was, uh, I got a chip on my shoulder. Did and you? It, I don't know where my drive comes from a little bit, but I hate to lose. And I hate anyone trying to fuck with me but i mostly want to be nice and friendly and stuff mm -hmm. but if someone goes i, I don't, i'm not good with that i i attack pretty hard not physically but i will you know have verbally to, you'll be some, you'll get that i have to get the upper hand but spade's got he's got a, an edge to him too you know well, i think that's my, why I, my good buddy spade yeah you know? we had a nice time we had dinner the other night that was fun. we ended up laughing our ass fun. off about your comedy team oh that australian was uh Dancers in Vegas, you know your movie idea that that they try to go to Vegas and they come like thunder down under, like oh, yeah. like models with their shirts oh, off, yeah, but they yeah. call themselves cocky and bows. Yeah. Oh, I'm cock, he's bows. <laughs> Together we're cock and bows, and then then you have a little, bit, you know, and it only lasts like one. It's only thirty seconds of the movie, but uh, that was just funny. But yeah, space. I think we, you know, it's like. He's fun. You guys have your podcast, right? It's called Fly on the Wall. Fly on the Wall. Uh, it's called Fly on the Wall. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a promotion. Yeah, David, known him since before SNL. Met him when he came in. He was always cool. You met him before that? Yeah. He was like 21. I was like 30 or something. And did you guys seem, did he seem similar to you kind of? Um, there was a period of time where, yeah, he was like definitely from my tribe. You know, we're, we have a, you know, there's... There was a time when he opened for me. So he's like 28, 29, I'm like 38. And we he'd come out and we were playing these sheds in the round in uh, the Northeast. And he'd walk out and they go, woo, from a lot wide shot. At that point, they thought it was me, uh, you know? And so, and but then- they're then, like, Oh, no, but no. Spade was so hip even then. Eventually, he just had shorts on and a skateboard, and he would kind of just hang over the stool, and he's like, what's up, everybody? And I go, I had this car. You can do it that way? I didn't even know you could do it that way, and he was hysterical. Because I come out jumping around, isn't that special? You know, I drenched in sweat, and Spade's just cool. He's got a little Diet Pepsi. What's up, ladies? You know? Yeah. So he's the coolest, but really fun to do a podcast with him. He can drop a little sketch in five seconds he can go he could take a story of just that the hamburger was overcooked and the guy's going i'm like Whoop, and I go, I go, hey buddy could you ch a little bit on that Whoop. i mean he'll create a complete sketch in five seconds so it's so much fun to watch it's so yeah. lo-fi he doesn't push it at all and uh -huh. you got to go back and rewind it almost <laughs> yeah yeah that's a remarkable way to say him it's like he like just he's not out there barking about his no. wares it's just like hey come see what i made he's got here. this little physical moves that's that beep, represent beep. another person little effect yeah and really funny word packages yeah. hey buddy yeah. <laughs> you know that was I learned that from John the Winners, you know. That was and then the rotary dial went out and I lost oh. my closer. Fuck! Oh, that's the worst. Yeah. That's the worst when time. Yeah, when times that's start to change. To yeah, I know. Isn't it weird about humor? Do you find this, Dana? That I, like I get scared that I don't know what the next generation of humor is because it's almost impossible to really know it because you have to like live you have to come up in it really yeah i know it's really interesting i mean obviously i don't generally now go east you know i don't do indian accents or japanese accents really i can do them 
you know, um, and I had a bit about them and I just sort of dropped it. I don't know. It's, it's, there's this sensitivity now, but I do agree with Bill Burr. He was on our podcast, Fly on the Wall, and that if the intent is to hurt is different than just an observation. Yeah. You know, I just was talking about where maybe the dialect of a Japanese accent came from. Just that every accent, like French, is de Bézy, la Rossi, where did that come from? Right. You know, and where did, you know, that. And I figured it's because of all the ring of fire, all the earthquakes. Mm. So you're just sitting around, you know, so that was that. So I don't know if you'll have to edit that out, but I just thought it was funny. I mean, so, because why do they talk like that? They could have talked like this. Yeah. Everybody could have talked like this. All humans, all humanoids were just, just grunting all over the world, pointing and grunting. Hey, 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 hey. And then the sounds came up. You know, and I think the Indian was more copacetic on the trade routes. Yeah. You know, it's lyrical and yeah. very copacetic. Like, I will not hurt you, right. but you will not hurt me. Bo, 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 bo. So I don't know if you have to cut this part out. No, I think it's interesting, man, because we used to play this game when I remember the first time we met a Japanese guy, we played this game where it was like, we would just make some sounds and see if it was something in Japanese, you know? Oh, that's it. We'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> and then we would ask him, you know, what the hell? Yeah, no, it's a, but it's, it's incredible accent to listen to. It's crazy to think that somebody has a whole different like, like Bible of what is sounds and thoughts inside. Oh, of I love it, and I'm just into rhythms. That's all, you know. It, they the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, mm. and, and when I hear, I just like it's just poetry to me. You know, with any accent. Well, it makes me think too what their thoughts and insides are like, you know, and what some of the mechanics are, are like inside of it, you know? That's what I wonder sometimes. And where does it come from emotionally uh, for the male and the female dynamic? Yeah, because ja like, ja like of a lot of Asian females are very. Like, yeah. And the men are kind of alpha male. Yeah. Which you can sort of practice probably lowering your voice. Yeah, yeah it's coming from, you know. Like a sea, it's almost where a semen launches from, like right there, you know? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that could, just, oh, that could be a guy ordering a Pepsi. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't. This is my favorite podcast ever. I'm just saying. There's, I think there's a like, guy ordering a Pepsi. I mean, yeah, exactly. Or a guy having a male orgasm. Yeah, and they don't have a lot of orgasms also in Japan and in. Uh, we're orgasm heavy over here. I mean, mm. we're skeeting up the landscape, you know, and then... Wait a minute. We're orgasm heavy. We're skeeting up the landscape. So in your I mind... I think so. In, we're, in America? We, orga we, we climax more than Japanese people or Asian people or any other culture. By far, I because think. Because we are the world, literally. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are the world. You know, we're... Were, were you in that video? <laughs> no, but I could do I could do a Springsteen if you want. We are the world. I'm Bruce Springsteen. I'm five foot seven on a good day. But with my boots and my cowboy hat, it's six feet of Springsteen coming at you. Sure, I could have fixed my underbite, but why? I'm worth a billion dollars and I love everybody. So anyway, that's... Uh, <clears throat> What were we saying? We are the... Remember oh, the Michael Jackson I, I just mean video? all the badass people of the world came to America. All the aggressive people are... We're, that's why right. we mm. are so freedom heavy here. If they told the anti-vaxxers, we're not going to admonish you. We're not going to say you're a piece of shit and you're a murderer. But could you please get a vaccine? They would have been like, sure, man. You just ask me. Yeah. But if you go, you got to get one. You Fuck you, me. man. American. No one tells me what to do. It's true, so it's just huh? the wrong strategy. Yeah. You know, Arnold did a PSA. It should have been instead of, you know, fuck your freedom. It should have been, you know, if you could look at it, you know, you could maybe go to the doctor. You get a little injection, you know, and you help all the people <laughs> instead of you murderers. <laughs> but we are badasses. We're the people, you know, my ancestors, just somebody at some point in Ireland just said, I think I'm leaving. Yeah. Oh, I'm out there. Where are you going? I don't want to stay here in the rain in the potatoes. I'm going yeah. to America. You could get killed. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. You know? We'll have a better menu. So where, you have Nicaraguan. Polish and Nicaraguan, yeah. So somebody probably fucked on a boat, I'm guessing, because I don't know how you even get that mix, you know, but. That's a steamroller that went through the Suez Canal and somehow connected your mom and dad. I don't know. It was a probably a 100-ton steamroller. 
I don't know. But I think, <laughs> look, man, I, I want to go back to this. I think we're semen heavy over here, right? Okay, so you mean <clears throat> we, we have a lot of semen or we climax a lot? We climax a lot here, yeah. I believe, in America. Because we're right. all, we're selling it now. There's you know, there's a lot of, and I know there's Japanese porn and stuff, but in Japan, like even if you go there, it's hard to meet women. There's not as much, I don't think, promiscuous sex. Uh, from um, what I've heard, anyway. Well, look, I don't know. Like, for me as a kid, you'd go to the dump or go in a park. And you'd, jerk you'd, off? You'd, no, you'd find a beat-up Playboy magazine. Oh, yeah. And I don't understand. I can't even wrap my mind around a 12-year-old online going on porn. Yeah. I don't know what, what toxicity or joy that represents, but... The boys are falling behind the educational system. So technology gave boys video games, mm -hmm. you know, and porn, and then said, now study your algebra. Yeah. Uh, I think I got something uh, better to do. We're yeah. gonna, you, you know, I'm so, about to find the square of my own root. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, <bro. laughs> At least he had a smart answer. <laughs> totally, Dad. I'm going to do it. So it's uh, the boys are behind now. The this is the it's been the year of the woman for the last thirty years, which I'm okay with. But here we are again in 2023. It is drum roll year of the woman again. <laughs> And so it's a great time to be a woman, and I'm all for it. It's just the boys have been, the porn and the video games are- We've been really beat down. Yeah. Did you ever tail end that? Did you, were you into Nintendo? Well, yeah, we got a Nintendo yeah. came out, I remember, and we get a game on our birthday. Usually you'd get a game, and your friends right. would come over to see what game it was. You had that one gift, and you'd open it, and- and when mm -hmm. porn came along, man, I remember, yeah, I would bike far for porn. If I heard there was porn somewhere, <laughs> you know, I was starved. I was starved for like effect from like for motherly affection. So I think when porn came around, it really started to fulfill some of that space in my well, life. Let, let me let me just unpack that for a minute. Because I was a therapist for a brief period of time. Were you really? I'm not. No. Yeah. But I, I love talking about human nature. So what do you mean you were starved for affection? Your mom didn't give you affection? Yeah, I think my mom didn't like look at me much. You know, she didn't. Did she She was, She you? didn't pick me up much, no. no. I had a sister that was real sick that had, uh, she was born with like a rare liver condition. And so mm. she is different than the rest of my siblings because she got actually like physically picked up. But my mom didn't, she doesn't know that there's like this emotional world at all. I think she just probably didn't get it, you know? I don't know if I got a lot of it either. I mean, maybe it was the '60s. I, you know, I don't remember. You know, I love you, but she was nice. She was sweet, but she was the sixth kid. She was as terrified of oh, my dad yeah. as we all were. You know, but oh, your mom was. Oh wow. Yeah, but she wasn't mean. She was sweet, but uh, she was terrified. We all were. It was just like you know. This one time I got up. Uh, these are just fun stories. I got up and. Uh, you know, I was like four or five and there was no toilet paper and I had to, you know, and so I used the towel and I was so young, I just put it back on the rack. <laughs> so to wipe my butt oh, yeah, and my dad dude. came out with it. Oh, yeah. And then I had to grab my ankles in front of everybody. And he had to ask my brothers how many. You had to go get his belt and he'd just snap it. You had to go grab it. You had to go get it? You'd get the belt, oh. and then he would snap it, and you'd grab your ankles, and then he'd ask your brothers, how many for it? So then your brothers get to chime <laughs> yeah. in. Yeah. Give him four. <laughs> four. And then he would just start screaming, you know you? So the next day, oh. I, I had short-term memory issues. I wiped my ass again with a oh. towel in his bathroom, and I put it back on the rack. No, I didn't do it a second what? time. I didn't do it a second oh, time. That would be so crazy. <laughs> But I wanted to tell you about my toys because we didn't have, I came up during so-called practical effects. Like we got Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Yeah, yeah. There was nothing visual on a TV screen. Okay. Rock'em Sock'em Robots was amazing. Getaway chase game. And we played a lot of board games. Yeah. It was, it, you know, they're kind of cool. Don't you find the tactile three-dimensional board Stratego or uh, Risk? Risk you ever play fun. Risk? Candyland we play. We played yeah. a lot of games. Scrabble we played a lot. I remember my favorite time actually as a kid was when the power would go out because our family had to all get together, you know? Mm -hmm. It was like we had to be kind of stuck in the same room because we needed like, right. you know, mom had two candles or whatever and so we'd have to go downstairs and so, and you couldn't really fight because if you if you fought and ran off out of the distance of the candlelight, it was real scary. So Yeah, power outages were hip. Everybody yeah. had to like, you yeah. kind of needed each other, you know? So it was like, yeah. there was, I used to kind of like hope that the power would go out because it would give me a time where 
I don't know. I just really like those moments where um, we all, it was like the only time I felt like our family, there was a semblance of that we needed each other, you know? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, I do know that the visceral feeling of like, you kind of say you're not feeling well, can't go to school. And then you had the house to yourself all day. Oh. Cause my mom taught preschool. And you're watching movies. And anybody can teach preschool. No offense to your mom. I'm sure she was awesome. No, she was, yeah, my sister became a preschool teacher. But being in the house by yourself and then looking out the window at like three o'clock and seeing the kids who went to school is a little melancholy. I was almost like a panic attack. Like I should have gone. Oh, yeah. And it's it's like when school was canceled, you find out that there's no school today because of whatever reason. All those feelings, same thing with the powers out, you know? And, you know, the all these things again they they inform us that's what my five years of therapy was about all those experiences and how they stay with you you know and how it manifests in you now yeah you know it's and, interesting how it does yeah. did was your so did, did your did you and your dad have a good relationship because it sounds like i think a lot of men from his era probably just had a tougher i think that it was a different thing of being a man back then it was full John Wayne shit, and he was so terrified of his son not being, you know, and he was an orphan, oh. and he went through different, you know, and then he got in the Navy in 1943 or something, or the Army. And now he's an orphan with a gun. Now he's, well, he was a radio operator in India, but I'm sure he had a firearm at yeah. some point. But it was, a, it was a different time, and, you know, sometimes I would pick up the phone at night, I'd hear his birth mother saying, do you forgive me, buddy? Because he was, nickname was Bud, forgiving him up at birth, oh. you know? So he had his, he was wounded and had that deep-seated insecurity. I think he had a little colorblind and a little dyslexic stuff that would have not been diagnosed. So he had an inferiority complex. But I, you know, in the end of the day, I don't harbor any, I mean, I'm kind of like, you know, just moving on. I mean, yeah. but, but there were times... There was a few times where I felt like he was being intentionally cruel to me and getting off on it. Mm. You know, because when all my brothers left, I was the last one to focus on. And I'm with my two high school buddies, cross country runners, really close friends. All we did was run. And I was gonna work this weed killer and spray it around the yard. So mm -hmm. he came in the garage to go, um, how do I get the top of this off, Dad? And he goes, this is with a quote. My friends never forgot it. Oh, Jesus Christ, use your penis, you shithead. <laughs> and so we broke that. Use your penis, you shithead. You know, it's like, okay, it's practical advice. I am a shithead. I don't know how to do it. Can I use my penis? Yeah. So I started, no, but that, but then he kind of, it was real anger. And my friends left. It, it freaked them out. And six weeks later, I got out of there. Wow. I thought, this is not good. Use your penis, you shithead. <laughs> <laughs> it's a poetry to it. You know, we all laughed a lot now. I mean, we, we laughed even then. We just have fits of laughter. Dude, you know? laughter was so much. There used to be a value to the moment, you know? And I think about this a lot, that there used to be like the moment was so yes. valuable because you couldn't, there wasn't a lot of recording of it. There wasn't, mm -hmm. nobody had the opportunity to see it again a million no. times over. It was like, this is the freaking yeah. moment. Are you gonna be here and right you now? you just go. And you know what I've observed is like, Young women are the happiest people on earth. Really? Because I go to Griffith Park and I got my sweatshirt hood on. I'm going, I'll see groups of high school or college girls mm -hmm. laughing and chirping and just like, and I'm just like, you know, it's like just giggling, just head back laughing. Yeah. But we did so much of that. That's what made me a comedian. The friends I had, they were, such, they were just really funny, had great sense of humor. And we just, just started performing, just laughing, laughing, laughing. And, you know, sometimes you lose that, but it's so fun to laugh. Like on this scripted podcast, mm -hmm. we had a, uh, right. we don't have to bring it up. but No, let's we, bring it up. I want to, yes. Yeah, but so we, we had a credit roll and Dex, my son Dex Carvey and Julia Madelich did so many things. It was during the pandemic. They they wore every hat. They're, they're directing, producing. So the credit roll at the end, I read it as a character. Mm -hmm. But they did so many things that it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And it wasn't one of the hardest I've laughed in the last five years. It was a character like this, co-directed by Julian Matulich and Dex Coffey, written by Dex Coffey and Julian Matulich, edited by Dex Coffey. And it went on and on. But they literally had to wear all those hats in the pandemic. We just did it at a table with a laptop. But that belly laughing is so valuable and so charming and you're right just just going with it we had a little bit the other night right before you that yeah, last 10 fun. minutes that was i good. was really because it 
just getting silly. You were in there, man. Cork in both. Oh, I'm cock. Yeah. He's Welsh. If, what was it? Yeah, what was it? We were talking about having like an Australian. It was like the thunder from down yeah, under. Yeah, thunder remember? from down under. Yeah. But if you're two characters and you're the, the Me cheap, and Spade would be the speech, guys. Yeah, you're like, it's a 2 p.m. little review. Yeah. And you'd be in Speedos. And so you decided, you spell it not, differently than cock and balls, but basically, oh, I'm cock, he's balls. He's balls. Together we're cock and balls. And then you yeah. start dancing. Yeah. Does a C Spade do that? It'd be pretty funny. And especially if one of them lost his cock and he is only balls, you know? <laughs> and that's why they had to do it. <laughs> Wouldn't that be crazy? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm not a cock. Oh, I'm only balls. <laughs> he's only cock. Together we're only balls and only cock. Sign on to www.onlycockonlyballs.com. Yeah, that's, anyway, I want to say cock and balls more on this podcast than there's any other one I've ever been on. <laughs> He's cocking on with balls, but it's just idiots with super cocky. That's the funny part. It's like, here we are. Here we are. Come watch us. Come see our uh, penises outside, inside. <laughs> I'm, do you think um i lost it in a wall in a lawnmower accent when i was a kid once the guy next door was mowing the lawn uh-huh. and rah, screaming and he, he cut off some of his toes right but the oh. ambulance got him but the toe was out there later yeah so then my brother brad came out and put it in formaldehyde no. my mom saw it and said we got to take it we got to get to the you know take him to the place and they went into like a medical center we just moved to this town and she went into a psychiatrist's office and she goes there's a boy <laughs> who's missing a toe in my car you know they said it's okay lady just have a seat you know but brad's kept that big toe and i remember looking at it you know wow yeah this episode is brought to you by better help i want to let you know that um there's nothing wrong with getting help you know i see therapists all the time and and um, I've had experiences where I just couldn't make it through my day. You know, I couldn't make it through the damn hour. I've had those experiences. Um, and I don't do it alone anymore. BetterHelp can help you. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. And I like to remind people that if you don't think your therapist is working, it's not challenging you, make a switch. Try another one. You can always come back. You can always try someone new. But don't sit there and continue to go to the same therapist if you don't feel it's being effective. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash T-H-E-O. That's betterhelp.com slash T-H-E-O. It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's also the most hectic time. You know, it's the time when the traffic starts to jam up and you're leaving out of here out of Hot Chocolate Avenue and trying to get over to brisket drive over there to be at a family function and you got a damn stop at a cvs to get a dang lipstick or something for somebody what i'm telling you is ship station is here to help when you're buried in orders and emails from stressed customers you'll wish you had ship station ship station helps you figure it all out helps you manage your e-commerce get your orders out easy ShipStation works with all your favorite places to sell online, including eBay, Shopify, Amazon, Etsy. Manage every order from one simple dashboard. Print shipping labels and easily compare rates and delivery times. And when you sign up for ShipStation using my promo code, you'll even get two months to try it free. Over 130,000 companies have grown their e-commerce business with ShipStation, and 98% of companies that stick with ShipStation for a year become customers for life. This holiday season, give yourself the gift of stress-free holiday shipping. Use promo code THEO today at ShipStation.com to sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com, promo code THEO. Yeah, I remember we found two fingers in the woods one time, like a peace sign. (laughs) 
Really? Yeah. And that we were actually spooky. collecting cans, and we found two fingers in the wood, in the woods. What else happened? Did you I, grow up in, is it suburb or rural? You're it was rural, rural but it wasn't oh, okay. redneck. So okay. I never had like any redneck stuff. We just had like a lot of poor people. Mm -hmm. Like we used to watch dogs give birth and people would bet on how many whelping, how much dogs, the ba the, how many babies were going to be in it. Um, yeah. We, we grew up like a hamster breeding area. We had a dude not far from us that used to breed hamsters. You know, it was big in our area. We mm. had, um, I used to clean out wishing wells. Our town had like apparently the most wishing wells per capita or something. Is that because of religiosity or just? Irishness, I guess, or I think people just love, you know, people just love having water hidden under the land. I'll I tell think. you, for me personally, when I had this uh, this bypass at forty two, I'm incredible now. No, but uh, you had a crowd group, uh, uh, yeah, you had no, a, heart a double, surgery? yeah. Well, the heart's perfect, but the artery was blocked. Damn, and I had to do a bypass, and they did it. They didn't do the right artery but they didn't harm me but i was fine but my indian cardiologist pk shaw mm -hmm. did a he went to mother teresha's gravesite and did a prayer for me mm -hmm. and then my irish super irish catholic mother-in-law born and raised in dublin she did a wishing well in dublin and then now i'm just perfect wow i don't know if it's true but you know i like i i leave a space in my head for spookiness oh me too i think it's one thing that used to really uh that is one thing used to help my imagination so much when i was young is that Anything could be possible, you know? Yeah. You heard a lot more lore and stuff back then. You know, that's one thing I really miss. Like, now it's like everything is, um, like I asked my little niece, I, I said, you should use your imagination. And she goes, um, what is it? Imagination? She thought it was an app on your phone. Oh, and I'm wow. like, oh my God. Like, Well, not to dovetail again to this goofy, uh, uh, this brilliant scripted podcast, but that is bringing that back for mom and dad's driving around with their kid. They're gonna just gonna hear a story. So let's go With into big it. Music so and big you guys sound. started it during the pandemic, right? Yeah. Dex and Julian came to me with the idea of my son Tom. They all grew up with Twilight Zone because I had the mix, I had the DVD at my house in the nineties. Okay. So they're obsessed by it. So we want they want to make a show like it. And we just came to them. We needed to have Rod and we knew it would be a big budget thing. So we decided to do it scripted podcast. And based on the Twilight Zone, but a comedy version. And they went downtown. We went crazy. So literally. a scripted podcast. Yeah, comedy podcast. Right. So it's yeah. basically where oh, you, it yeah, where you, it's where like you guys write it out in advance, right? Well, we wait. Here's what, here's what happened. Okay. We tried to do it. We wrote it, recorded it, and it sounded like some people were on a pirate ship. We we're like, wow, this is awesome. Then we play it for people, and they're just checking their phone. That's pretty good, dude. Whatever. We got, holy fuck, this is not like old time radio. You're competing for someone's mind where they got their phone in their hand. So then we kept redoing it, restacking it, record it, write it, add effects, better, re-record it, more music, more effects. We had access to all this lush music in the Warner Brothers library because we did it with Team Coco and they had a deal with Warner Brothers. Nice. Big orchestral score. So you want to make it filmic and uh, ear candy and intensity. And then we go, but people get lost. They're, they're listening to it in traffic. Someone cuts them off. Fuck you. And then they lose the thread of the story. So we go, clarity is king. So we had to put more exposition in a funny way. So the narrator rod. So we loaded clarity. We loaded ear candy effects. We made it potent, potent, potent to the point where then we loved it. But it took like a year in a room. And these guys, Dex and Julian, just became this two-man band because it's pandemic time. So they literally... they. They looked at, a, what, a thousand songs? I don't know. We got Dex. Dex is here. He's sitting in the... A thousand songs? Yeah, or how many songs? Mike? Yeah. yeah. Let's ask him. And this is your son. This is your human son. This is my human son. Yes. Dex up, Carvey Dex? and Julian Madelich. This is the two-man team that went crazy in a good way, producing, writing, and directing. It was such a blast. It was such a good learning experience because you could... Uh, Listen back to something. If it didn't work, you can just do it uh, right over immediately. Now, did it feel weird, like using, like, because your father obviously is a talented instrument that a lot of the world has used to have humor and to feel joy and and to feel different things. Yes. Did it ever feel weird as his son? Like, r is there like a strangeness there? Like request, you know, trying to like, does that ever feel uncomfortable? I didn't have a real relationship with my father, so I don't, you know, it's tough for me to gauge any of that. But I'm just curious about it. Oh, I, I think it could be super uncomfortable just because generally shows where it's a famous dad and his kids uh, really suck. 
It generally yeah. sucks. That's just <laughs> common knowledge. Shows here ever. come the kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, here comes Ronnie Tarantino. Let's see what he's got going Maybe on. Maybe you could stand up with that. Or... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, is this better? Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah, and if we can't see you too, that's yeah, okay. That's, as long as we can hear Julian you. Julian there. Oh, okay. yeah. And that's Julian with you. That's your partner there? Yeah. It's that, my childhood friend. I uh, lived right next door He to would us. come over and watch the Twilight Zone, okay. Julian. And they're the ones who really went downtown on this and went a little crazy. We just went crazy with it, to be honest, Theo, because we could, mm -hmm. and we just, it wasn't like a movie, you make it, you know it sucks, you have to walk away. We just kept redoing it, and then we learned the space now. We think we reinvented it, and whoops, number four on, you know, podcast. Uh, yeah, you guys are it's doing four, very well. You guys are number four on Apple Podcasts. Today, anyway, for a scripted comedy podcast, which is a very tough space, so we, we are, we're very proud of it, and we love it, and it, it deals in emotionality, too, in a subtle way. It has story arcs. It has a filmic sense to it. And mostly the word packages and the rhythms of the characters, because that's what I harbor in, those were so much fun to do. And so. Dex, did your father play all the characters? Did you play some of the characters? Did Julian play some of them? Who played what? We got we got a few little ones. Um, my dad did most of the... The voice is just because, again, it was like, I don't want to have, uh, you know, it's, it's Dana's kid tries voices for the first time. Yeah. You know? It's just like, I, I, we really like this show, so I just want them to focus on the show and not about the people involved as much. But uh, Did yeah. you enjoy, so a lot of producing and writing from your side? Yeah, I think all, I mean, that was, was cool. I mean, it was, I'm not really that familiar with the whole writing stuff but like this is like stay the first on. project but like it's a sketch in we just stay sat on the mic. at a table and just yeah like, just stay on the mic you're good just stay on the mic we don't yeah but basically we're riffing and we're at we're at a impasse mm -hmm. with the story okay okay and dex or julian would say something like okay the alien has to stay on earth what if he gets addicted to earth food and he gains so much weight he can't get home on his spaceship so i'm like oh shit that's it that's it. So they're writing in that kind of way. And then we're all rewriting for clarity. And we all learn together. I, I know a lot more about making uh, film or telling stories now by doing this. But they then they would they would do a rough edit. They would add effects. They would do music. We'd work on it again together. Wow. And then everyone was wearing every hat. Because I would look up from the mic after doing a take at Dex and Julian. And I would go by them. And they might go, I think that last take or this take. And we're picking takes. And uh, I just give him a lot of props because that's I I love crazy and I'm crazy. I mean I don't I I if I'm working on something like I'll draw a little bit or play a song, I'm as excited about that as being on Saturday Night Live. It's a weird discovery. It's almost scary. Mm. That that's all I care about. So this was all from the heart, um, and not for money or fame. It's just completely a message in a bottle. That you hope people can get a little peace in their in their brains for a while. And the weird place it's called? It's called the weird place anywhere where you can get a podcast. Yeah, we'll put the link below so people can uh, get a hold of it and check it out. Now, is each episode different, Dex, or what's that like? Is each episode it's like its anthology? Own? Yeah. So yeah. anthology means what? Just it's basic three basic stories. Uh, the first one is about a nuclear submarine, 1966, that goes through a time portal okay. and surfaces in 1738 and sees a pirate ship. They don't even know they've gone back in time. Wow. And there's a whole story around that. The second one was this alien who has to come to Earth and befriend an Earthling to get get them to help him make bomb-making materials. So he tells this sweet old lady that that's what he eats on his planet, ammonium nitrate, nitroglycerin. <laughs> Can I have some ammonium nitrate, Sal? What do y'all want that for? To eat because it's food? So that one's a little funnier, but he's the one who gets so heavy he can't escape in the spaceship. They become friends. And then the final one is about a guy who's gets bullied by these guys and he goes to this this knickknack store and this strange colorful character gives him a globe and it's a magic globe and if you touch the globe you affect the real world mm -hmm. so he touches the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower he touches Paris man one day I will go to Paris and then there's mayhem in Paris so that one is really very Twilight Zone really wow. special there's a lot of songs and uh, there's a companion piece called Talking Weird mm -hmm. it's sort of an after show that Rod interviews some of the uh, voice actors and there's some singing in that. And Rod so, is your character, so people know. <clears throat> Rod is, we needed a Rod Serling character and so we needed that gravitas and that voice to give us that vibe. And the music's all from the 60s. There's no sex or violence, no real violence. Um, and there, it's, it's very 60s. It has an earnestness to it, you know, a sincerity to it. It's not cynical. It's not dark. And Rod know? Serling, so people know who that is. That is a show in the 19... 
60s called The Twilight Zone. Oh, okay. And there's been reboots. Black yeah. Mirror was sort of a brilliant, dark version of it. Black and Mirror then Jordan good. Peele did did The Twilight Zone. Mm -hmm. And so we just did our own thing and we kept it earnest and we kept it roticized for our purposes. So, you know, we did a lot of characters. Yeah, there he is. That's him. Yeah, that's him. Justin Thoreau Jr. Look at him. Yeah. And is he related to the um mm -hmm. to Archbishop or whatever, the Canadian um You think that's who he looks like? Justin Thoreau. Well that well, I just keep thinking Justin Thoreau for Hollywood out there should play Rod Serling in a biopic. Yeah. Because I think he does look kinda like him. If you could throw up Justin Thoreau if you want, but Yeah, let's you know. get a quick picture of Justin Thoreau real quick and then I got uh, just one more question for Dex too. Um Mm -hmm. And he loves older women. I think he's into. Well, he was with Jennifer Aniston for a while, right? But... Oh no, I'm thinking of the Prime Minister of uh, Canada. <laughs> yeah, right, oh. Justin Trudeau. Trudeau. Yeah, yeah. Justin Trudeau. <laughs> so you thought he looks like Rod Serling? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's funny. They maybe they both do. Oh, that's funny. There you go. He okay. Does. He, man, yeah, he you could it. carry it off, but you could see that uh, Justin Thoreau, who's Just... a brilliant Justin writer. Yeah, and Justin. Trudeau is the prime minister of Canada. He looks like he's hey. still like he eats adult applesauce. <laughs> he this does. Guy. He looks like an applesauce face. Yeah. If his face was a fruit product, it wouldn't just be an apple. It'd be applesauce. And yeah. it'd be very the runny kind, not oh, the good kind. That's bad. The shitty kind, like high C. You oh, have to look get, at him. You got have to get Kool-Aid when you can't afford high C. Well, there he is. Jesus, God, Christ sakes, got his hands around the bun there, all right? That's a good look for the leader of a large nation, okay? Do the double knuckle grip on some chick's ass. That's what we need in our prime ministers, okay? Uh, I can really, my IQ goes up when I become Dennis. Yeah? You know, I just know that he won't ever say anything directly as his own poetry. <laughs> okay, Theo Vaughn there, rocking the mullet. That's a good look, circa 2022. Yeah, spent some money on the studio here. What is this, six by eight? Looks like a prison cell or something, okay? Dressing it up with the psychedelic pictures? Okay, good. You put down the hash pipe, Vaughn, okay? Do a podcast. So, you know, it's just he's uh, just a brilliant comic He's awesome. Brain. I went on his show one time. Did you? Yeah, he's an yeah, amazing so cool. improviser. Yeah. Yeah, was it fun? Um, oh, I have one more question for Dex. Let me get it so I don't forget. Um... Yeah, is this is this something that you guys think you would do more of, or would it, did, did did this feel like too kind of harrowing? Ah, um... oh, I would love to do it again. It it was pretty intense, just because it was just three of us, and we also really it took like half the time just to figure it out. We just didn't really know how to. Yeah, it's a lot. It I'm sure it sounds right. like a lot of learning. I, I think we and Julian can talk for a sec too. I I think that we did figure it out we have a work process now mm -hmm. it might be a little bit like first time you do a podcast and now you kind of know you know i'm learning with spades still but we we could go faster we would need a little more help you know maybe a secondary mixer we hired one yeah um, we had michael gordon uh from conan um great writer we had a, a, he's doing some assisting for us but we were basically a three-man band but we could move faster it's like this is proof of concept right and we may release uh, an episode soon. We had a, an episode that we held that Tom thought of. It was about uh, uh, Valdemar Putin goes through a wormhole and ends up in a guy's uh, bedroom in, in rural Mississippi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mississippi Joe. Yeah. No, what, can I, oh, excuse me. Who are you, sir? <laughs> Who am I, sir? What do you, th you must be KGB agent. Well, KGB agent? I surely don't know what you're talking about, sir. I would, you know, so that's that's maybe a bonus episode coming out based on popular man demand. You okay. Know. Yep. That's cool, man. Yeah, I think I would love to see Russia versus Mississippi. So I would love to watch that. I'd watch that on pay per view. Even damn it. You know, well, I'll tell you, you know you. the the idea, not the romance, or maybe the romance, not the reality, but the idea. When I gone to Mississippi and the South with a gentleman, a, a friend of mine. And uh, there is a charm factor, a politeness, a way of speaking that to us Northerners is just very, very charming, you know? Yeah. And uh, people say darling, people will damn, darling. I mean, they'll breastfeed a damn adult if they need it, you know? It's just that kind of place, you know? <laughs> 
It's not. <laughs> you darling, you know, you all, you all need some breast milk. I know you're 47. Come on over here. Here's my titty. Now put your mouth around while I'll squeeze real hard. There you go. There's your breast milk. I just want to make you feel better. I know I've just committed three felonies, but that breast milk's coming nice and clean. Yeah. You too. I'll give you the other side. Yeah, it's a very yeah. polite. Welcome Sorry, to I'm Logan's just t- Roadhouse, and it's always at a restaurant too. You know. Yeah, it's just the idea of the South and the movies, and you know, and, and the um, what y'all fixing to do, or or you know, it's like Al Gore. People should think I did him gay, but I wasn't. I was doing a Tennessee gentleman. He's just, I take umbrage with your attitude, kind of, madam. And he's sort of, you know, put together as a Tennessee gentleman. Oh, yeah. Not a rural rat scat like Mm-mm. you from deep rural Louisiana. No, sir. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, you up here. I wear a fine, I wear a fine vest, yeah. sir. And I say to you, sir, that the <laughs> South will rise again, I tell you. You know, so I do love, I love Southern accents. I love Bill Clinton. I love being this guy. That's the most seductive. No wonder he got in trouble because this is this hypnotizes the women. Oh. This gets them all bunched up downstairs, if you know what I mean. When I say, uh, baby, I say, you you have the prettiest eyes I've ever seen. God. And they will drop drawers in a second. Dude, I'm I'll like, fold my nuts into a dang vagina right now, brother. I'll meet you halfway, <laughs> bud. <laughs> my dang. favorite old-fashioned dick joke is... This woman says to me she wants 12 inches. I said, hey, baby, I don't fold it in half for anybody. I mean, that's the best <laughs> dick joke. You've never heard that? <laughs> that's the best dick joke ever. But who has this guy, Larry Reeb, has this joke. He said, uh, <laughs> he goes, uh, my wife told me never answer the phone during sex. I said, what if it's you calling? <laughs> It's just an old joke, but I love it. Man. Oh, I loved old, old fashioned. My favorite joke jokes. ever is like, mm. "What's the last thing you want to hear when you're getting a blowjob? When, when you're giving a blowjob to Willie Nelson? I'm not Willie Nelson. <laughs> How do you get a dog to stop pumping your leg? Pick him up and blow him. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I love these old jokes. What? Is, what's the worst thing you can hear when you get a prostate exam? Look, Ma, no hands. <laughs> These are just classics. I used to do this old bit about, can you have a prostate exam joke in your act? Let me think I about don't do it. this one anymore, but if you need it, you can have it. All right. I might take it. This is like, I hate, you know, you have to bend over and they're going to probe you. And it's like, I like to take the power back. So they start to do the exam and I always go, is that all you got? <laughs> is that it? Come on. <laughs> So it's a commitment joke. You know, you got to just go full tilt. Come on. <laughs> Get in there. Get in there. You do a lot with genitals, you know, being crooked or only the balls or they're folded or creased. It's a funny rhythm you have. I'd, I'd fold my nuts in half and put them in a. Oh, mer- yeah. Well, I think give you got to. Mer- <laughs> That's your fucking first origami, dude, is your damn nuts, you know, because they're so malleable and so like. It's really such a, cr- if somebody gave you a pair of nuts, it would blow your mind, you know, like in just loose off of a body. Um, yeah. Just I mean, the, how it's built and everything. It's really insane. Um, yeah. It's, and there's uh, two nuts in there. You know, that's what's right. craziest thing about you. Sometimes I forget that I have two nuts inside of my nuts all the time. I just forget about I mean, it. I mean, two testicles inside of your scrotum. Yeah. Using the testicle touch. <laughs> yeah. and the penile will enlarge. You know yeah, yeah. Yes. Man, dude, I mean, you remember sex ed? You remember going to sex ed the first oh time? Oh, God, how embarrassing. You know? Dude, we all wore, I remember all the guys would like, one guy wore like a fucking suit or like a little tuxedo. We're like, dude, what is going, this guy is spaced, bro. Well, People would wear cologne. People would be fucking drinking cologne. Guys putting <laughs> cologne on in their car before. Like, it was the first Cologne day. to go to sex education? Like, they're seducing know. sex education? Or was the teacher hot? No, it was a man, dude. But just sex education, they wanted to smell good for sex education. We just thought it was time for sex. So we were just, everybody's God. keyed well, up. We would, we, would, we would wear hooter clamps just to keep our junk in place. You really? Know? Hooter clamps, they're just sort of like this thing you wear, like a leather diaper that keeps your junk in one place. No, I made that up. But that's oh. a joke we used to have, hooter clamps. <laughs> Are you wearing a hooter clamp tonight? Yeah, I got my hooter clamp on. Good. I and mean, we'd laugh for hours about hooter clamps. It would just keep your kind of wiener down? Which was an invented idea. Maybe Brad thought of that. I don't know. It's just when that time when you're 20, 22, and you just go off on those, like we said, just just laughing. Now, did you ever feel left out if your brother started to get erections and stuff and you didn't have any yet or anything <laughs> like that? 
Most of the erections were private. Did you ever do a circle jerk with your brother and sisters? I mean, no, we never did anything like that. I remember one I have time. To ask. One time we got under this blanket and things were like a little strange, but it wasn't anything too crazy. And our bud and my buddy was there too. It was just almost like a Native American type of deal. You know, it wasn't Native American. Like you were under the blankets, like a tent. Yeah, and yeah. And then things start a tent started to form in your pants and you didn't know what it meant and you ran away. We were all just kind of chatting naked under this blanket and then everybody started getting an erection. I think nobody wanted to like admit it, you know? So everybody was just kind of pretending like they weren't getting an erection. We were more innocent. We would make my sister play waitress like on a rainy day. You go, she wanted to play with us. Now you can't. You go, but you could play waitress. Okay, so she'd make us root beer floats and stuff and she'd bring them in like a waitress. You go, yeah, okay, clean it up. You know, <laughs> next day, can we get a cheeseburger? With cheese, <laughs> she became a really good fry cook for a while. <laughs> but she wanted to be our friend so bad, we just put her to work. I mean, this was the this is the rough and tumble Carvies. This is yeah. like the sons of Katie Elder. I mean, we were we were just badass weirdos building forts, tents, fighting. Was squeezing. it weird? So whenever you started to have like a lot of popularity in your life from work and stuff, mm -hmm. was it? Oh, was that? Was it tough with your relationship with your brothers? Like, did you ever get scared? Like, oh, this is going to take away? Because I've felt that in my own life. Not felt it, but I've just. I, I guess I've worried well, about that's it. A, that's a real thing. That's going to take away, or it's going to make my brother think I don't care about him as much, or something. I don't know. Well, I just it, nothing changed on my side, but my brother Scott had a sense of humor about it. He would introduce himself after I got some amount of fame as Dana Carvey's brother. Mm. Hi, what are you? My name's Dana Carvey's brother. My other name is Scott Carvey, but my primary name is Dana Carvey's brother. So we just laughed about it and just kept in touch. I would do these things called Lost Weekends to stay in touch with my friends, my high school friends, my brother when I was, you know, peak SNL. So we'd all go to Vegas. Everyone gets their own room. We go see shows. We went out to Lake Mead when it was there. Everyone would get a wave runner. Wow. We'd have beer and sandwiches in the front and we'd go out there with crystal clear and we'd go to islands and dive off rocks and just have a blast. So I just went the other way. I, I made a lot of new friends, you know, from in show business, but I have a lot of core, core friends. And, you know, fame is a motherfucker, you know? I mean, there's no way around it. It's just very strange. And you're you're still on the upslope. So um, your brother, did you look up to him? He was older? Yeah, not as kids I didn't, but as adults I really have, you know? Yeah. He's a really, really special guy. And so, yeah, I don't worry. I just, I don't know. It was just, sometimes I just don't want him to think that I, I, I don't know. I think we do know, a pretty decent job. It's it's just weird. And yeah. then the money comes. I remember just, I had the thing like, I'd go to a mall and I'd think everywhere I look, I could buy it. Anywhere I look, I could buy it, you know? And I, I one time went in and I got like a Mercedes because like an Elvis move. At a mall? No, not at a mall, at a dealership. But I got, yeah. I got, I left the mall and I pointed at this one and it was like a Mercedes coupe, but I realized later on it had a plastic windshield. It was like 125,000, it'd be like 250 now. So I turned it back in and I got a big giant Mercedes, giant SLE 550, huge thing. And I was going into 7 Eleven just in the valley and people were looking at me. So then I just went to a Honda Pilot. Ever since then, I like to get rid of stuff. I don't want, I have one car, one wife, you know? So, <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't need a lot of things. I like guitars. I like things I can interact with, mm. you know? A woman, a guitar, a piano, a swimming pool, you know, things that are- Stuff that works? Tactile. Well, I can't get that excited about a chair and just look at the chair. Yeah. That's all right. My wife does. You know, it's just an interior designer mind, an aesthetic mind. I'm more in the internal world, but I, it's not self-congratulatory. But going back full circle to your brother, yeah, it's so it's um you could feel maybe a little guilt about it because you're changing the dynamic of how he's perceived, you know, which is normal. It's nothing. Yeah, I think you it's know. you. I don't want him to ever. I don't know. I just didn't want my brother to think that I, he felt that I ever felt like I was more important than him, or something like that. I don't know. And maybe that's all egotistical to even think that way. You know, um, it's it, you're just a passenger in this. So you just did this. I don't even know what your resume was before you did this. And then you got really successful, extraordinarily successful. And that's just the train you're riding. You, you couldn't will it, but you were active. You did the necessary steps. But this lane that you're in now, where it's Theo Vaughn world, and you run a, you're a CEO of a business, and you don't bow down to anyone. No one tells you you're fired. This is awesome. I'm glad I live long enough to see this. That's how us doing this this scripted podcast with just a laptop and the effects and and all the things we could get for ourselves. It's such an equal playing field for art and creativity. And you're like one of the 
big, you know, people out there that have done this, you and Tim Dillon and others, but it's a magic world and you can't hope that you're successful. I'll be therapist for a second. Yeah. You know? Thanks, That's not man. nothing. You just ride in the train that, you know, and what happens over time, I'll tell you this much. Everyone's all excited. You're famous. And then it gets boring. Yeah. It might, might be 10 more years, but at some point it's full circle back to Theo. Just like, and you're still going and doing stuff, but like been there, done that. They're used to all the stuff. But in the early heady days of it, you're picking up checks, you're renting cars, you know, and uh, it's just a little bit of a whoop de doo I mean, I, I sort of got famous in a sense at 31 or 32. And um, so I had a long runway before that. You know, if you make it as a child actor, that's that's fucked up. You know? Yeah, it's scary. I mean, it just killed that one kid. You know, you saw that Aaron Carter. He just, yeah, you know, he drowned mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. He drowned out. I think he. They said he was huffing duster, which I've done. I'm not going to lie about that. What, you know, what is that gonna, specifically? Huffing duster. Yeah, A S D F L Sam or whatever you know or ever, whatever it is. Oh, okay. And you hit you know hit yeah. the duster, but yeah, I, I've hit it before. I love it, but I think it's sad to see what happened. You know, he was a child star, and then next you know he's got six or seven service animals. I mean, he had a damn, you know, he was a, in the damn Iditarod, it looked like. The guy had so many service animals, yeah, and then he was getting tattoos and neck tattoos and just... Once it creeps up on the face, you just feel like it's a cry for help. Yeah. You know, it's like, what can I put on my face that'll make me okay? And the interesting part about therapy is just checking your thoughts. And that's a daily thing, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. Because if you get redundantly into those negative thoughts and you water those roots and then they get in your head, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, that's, you have to really fight all that stuff, you know? It's a really interesting game inside your head. It all happens in here. All your joy, your sadness, your pain, just it's all here, you it's know? It's wild, huh? And how you decide it is, that's how it is. You ever meet a really? I have a friend Chuck who's just a really happy person. Oh yeah, he talks I get so like angry this. At him. He's like he talks. This guy talks like this, you know. He's like the other day, you know, I was running on my hop on my bike, you know, and the wind was coming. I don't know what the fuck was going on. <laughs> you know, he's a mechanic for United. He's a really bright guy, but he's just got this Dems and Does thing of like, you know, you ever go to New York and these Brooklyn guys? I had a friend who passed away. He's just like, you know, he's really like, you know, the guy, you know, God rest his soul. My mother did this for me yeah. and this and that. You know, you got to take care of your family. It's a way of just simplifying this ride, this 70, 80, 90 year ride that we're all taking on. Just keep it real basic. Right yeah. here, I'm with you right now. We're bonding over humor and telling stories, you know, and I think that, you know, that Theo's, you know, he's a good guy, you know, and you had a nice chat. He would come to SNL and he was a basketball freak. He would critique my SNL with basketball <laughs> stats. Yeah, He'd come up because I do church late, whatever. He goes, 28 points, 12 boards, <laughs> six assists. <laughs> <laughs> Capiche? He always, his catchphrase was this, which is another good one he did with my brother Scott. You do what you do. I do what I do. Rubber chicken. Capiche? <laughs> I don't know why it's rubber chicken, but it just works. You do what you do. I do I what I do. do. Rubber chicken. Capiche? And then this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Capiche? But he made everything simple. Same with Chuck. Live in the moment, and it's a struggle if you're, you know, a curious, active brain. But it's, uh, you know, it's fun. Yeah, staying well, in that. It, yeah, I think it, it's true. It's that it does all happen between the walls of your own head. You know, it's crazy. That that's really where you get. That's really where you got to tend the soil a lot, and not even over tend it. Sometimes you get so stuck on taking care of yourself that then that's all you're doing. You know, it's like I mean, mentally or physically or all of it. Mentally, all of it. But yeah, it, all of it. It's like I got to make sure I'm okay. You know, something that's a, a, a hamster wheel people can really get on nowadays. Um, yeah, I when, think nothing has to happen to something that's helped me recently. You get all pent up. Nothing has to happen. Yeah. No, you know, this could have got canceled. Nothing has to happen. Just just everyone calm down. We're just here. Yeah. Nothing has to happen. We're not going to the movie. No. Yeah. No, not, not, not tonight. Yeah. Nothing has to happen. It's just yeah. the way of everybody calm down and just laugh your ass off and make art. No nuggets. <laughs> no nuggets. No nuggets tonight. Damn. God damn, damn it. Nothing has to happen, dude. Nothing has to happen. Uh, it's okay. No one's thinking about me right now. If anyone out there is thinking, is Theo okay? I mean, everyone's inside their own kiosk, you know? Yeah, I think um, 
it was interesting. So you, so when you got, you had a lot of fame that happened, and then you kind of took a break. Did you? Is this okay? This is a, from just an outsider's perspective. Oh no, no, totally. I, I had this weird. You took a break trait. to take. Was it to be a dad? No, it's very it's much more complicated than that. So basically, I did all this stuff before SNL because I was insecure, but I was in the club starting to kick ass. But I did a sitcom with Mickey Rooney, Nathan Lane, in New York. Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney. Did you read his book. No, I know Mickey though. Oh. Well, this, he passed away, didn't he? He did, but he made it to like 95. Yeah, yeah dude. Did you hear about the story where some, he slept at somebody's house for like a couple weeks, right? Yeah. Oh, no. He let somebody stay in his house for a couple weeks. He was married to some like bombshell, right? Yeah, he, he all six of the hottest stars in the world. And I said, Mickey, how'd you get him? He goes, money makes you handsomer. Money makes you handsomer is his own word. But go ahead. What was his story? A guy stayed at his place for a couple of weeks and he left him a couple paintings as a gift. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, and then like a few months later, he was getting a divorce or something. And so yeah. his, a friend helped him move. And he said, oh, you can have those. Somebody left them here. And they were Salvador Dali's. They were two Salvador Dali paintings. Wow. And he talked about struggling with his, with money most of his life. Oh, yeah. And uh, and then here he was giving away a couple dollies like that. Jesus. Just kind of crazy. Yeah, there he is right there. There he is. When I, oh, there I am. This is the tallest I've ever been. Mickey's like, oh, he wow. called himself, I'm a fire plug. <laughs> you know, built like a fire. And Nathan Lane, and that he was my grandfather. And I was just cast uh, from NBC. I got a deal freakily. I, I had a teen idol thing going on. And go, you're going to play Mickey Rooney's grandson in New York. And then I met Nathan, and Mickey thought I was gay the whole time. Wow. He would put his arm around Nathan and look at me and go, I'm just glad we like girls. <laughs> and he finally got money because he was broke for 50 years. And Who he Rooney had, was? Rooney was broke. I called up Warner Brothers in 1955. <laughs> I said, this is Mickey Rooney. He was always doing this. I need a job. And he'd stare off and he'd go, he hung up on me. And then you'd come into the the... the the studio, and you'd hear him down the hall. How long has Rod for Robert Redford been in the business? He's one of those guys who would talk till he ran out of air. How long's Robert Redford been in the business? Ten years. I've been in the business sixty-two years. How old are you? Sixty-two and two months. I mean, he's one of those guys who's a baby. Oh, yeah. He had so many. He would say this a thousand times, literally, literally. He would say this every day. I was the, which he was, he was the number star, number one star in the world, 1937. I was the number one star in the world. You hear me? Bang. The world. And he did that. You hear me? Bang. The world. I saw it. <laughs> but he had finally had money. He was doing a Broadway show on our show. He went to the racetrack all week. It was old show business. We had a guy who was five feet tall. His head was... And we would just rehearse with him all week. Yeah. But Mickey would have like $5,000 and he'd put it in front of my face. And he goes, think I can afford lunch? <laughs> <laughs> and he had a 38. Yeah. He didn't like the script. He would bring it out <laughs> and he'd throw the script. This script is caca. And he's waving this 38 around. And he puts it back in. He goes, they're not going to get me. Who? Well, uh, he was going to kill Juan Corona, this serial killer. Before this, I was going to go to see Juan Corona. And I would say, you know who I am? I'm Mickey Rooney. And I was going to plug him full of holes. <laughs> he was the craziest, greatest. He would play a piano because he was a jack of all trades. He played his piano chords. He goes, this is Stephen Sondheim's favorite song. But then we bonded. He thought I was a hack and an idiot. But then <laughs> I was able to do Jimmy Stewart for him. So that's when oh, I when from, I got him. I go, how 30... you doing, Mick? Yeah, good, to, good, to, good to say. Ya. And said he was an impressionist too. He's like Sammy Davis Jr. Just could do anything. How you doing? So man? we got going toward the end, and Nathan and I, and you know, there's so much more to it. But Meg Ryan played my girlfriend, Set, Scatman Carruthers. First time I really befriended this beautiful older black man from the wow. south i think or whatever but scat man carruthers and he was like such a poet my brother came out to visit me and he say see that man over there with the broom he's an artist we're all artists and he played the ukulele and he'd walk around in the studio it had an unmarked bottle this big of pills and he just chugged some the other vitamins i'm going to 100 i'm doing mickey now i'm going to 100 so what happened was he had he he smoked a lot of weed. It was always weed everywhere. Scatman? Yeah, oh, Scatman. Yeah. So during the break, I went back to San Francisco. Oh, there he is. Man. 
he was the nicest guy. So Scott and I got like 10, we got like two lids of Colombian pot. Those days you'd fly yeah. with it. I guess we put it in the suitcase. We gave it to Scat Man in Rockefeller Center. This is 1981. Mickey Rooney's around. Scat, here you go. Next day, he's in the elevator with me. He says, because, you know, he grew up during secrecy with pot. He said, the music was good. Uh, might I get a pound? <laughs> <laughs> so it was the best pot he ever had. And he could look at, not even look at you and roll a joint, and it was closed on both ends. Oh. So then after the show got canceled, he was living in Van Nuys. And so Scott and I brought a bag of Santa Cruz Colombian. We didn't even smoke pot at that point, maybe a teeny bit. But we brought it to him. And he played ukulele. He goes, I got a bad wheel. And it was just so such a sweet, such a sweet guy. That was a cool part of that story of meeting him and hanging out with Scat Man. Oh, yeah. There's nothing better that feels I feel is better than giving like good weed to a black guy, I feel like, too. There's just something as a white guy that about there that feels good, you know? I guess so. I just, you know, I didn't, I grew up, you know, mostly it was a white neighborhood and we had an integrated high school. When I was 14, I was standing there, Carmont High School, 2,500 kids, and they brought all the kids in from East Palo Alto. So these bus, buses showed up and 500 black kids came in to the school and all I was worried about was they'd think I was prejudiced. So I'd say something that sounded prejudiced. But then, you know, we all, they all ran on the team. We all hung out. But Scatman was just sort of, he's just a poet, you know. Just yeah. everything he said was poetry, you know, some of these people. like Yeah, my dad had this fellow named, uh, his last name, Wilson, right? And he had a, one of his limbs was shortened out, right? He probably had that, you know, he had that damn sand mm. wedge on him. He had that pitching wedge on mm. his left. Mm. And so they would, they would cut a bunch of, he had a bunch of piece of tire cut and, and just kind of gl either glued yeah, yeah. or nailed onto the bottom of that Interesting. shoe. And he would stand, sometimes when he didn't have his uh, good shoe or whatever, he would stand on a little stoop so he looked even from far off, right? It was just yeah. a big, he didn't want to be uneven, you know? Was he a vet or was it just congenital or an accident? He just probably, I mm -hmm. don't know, maybe he got raised in an area on an uneven surface. I have no idea what happened to him, right? Mm. But they, um, he used to put, uh, he would hang out with my father and he would, you know, go get lunch for him and stuff. Sometimes my dad worked a, in a French Quarter for a little while mm. selling, I think, some kind of bullshit. But this guy would help him out and he some, he would put cinnamon on his palm of his hand and let us lick it off when we were children. You never forget that. Uh, my grandmother bring date cookies and stuff. And that uh, seemed exciting. Um, any old person so good to treat anything, they hook you up, let you lick their hand or whatever. Yeah. You felt, it just made you feel... One thing I, I appreciate, like my mother had a friend that was just from Montana. Her name was Cookie. So she's an old person who just giggled all the time. Mm. When you didn't meet a bitter, you, you just, I met a lot of bitter people. They didn't like being old and my date, you know, it's like, okay, show business especially or life is a bitterness factory. So be one of those cheerful. Don't be mad at someone for being young because James Ferentino was mad at me for being young when I did Blue Thunder. Really? So I was in this mock helicopter, another show that I did, and he was purely doing massive amounts of coke. He had a styrofoam cup this big, a straight vodka. What? When we were in the mock helicopter with our helmets on, acting. And then I got fired from that. That's crazy people would do that then because they don't do that now. I know, it was so obvious because he got out of the chopper, his dealer was over there, and then I thought I'll just take a sip of water. I was so young and naive. He would take, he was like Scarface. He'd take the script out and he'd just pound it on the uh, instrument panel and the fake helicopter were like 10 feet in the air and they're blowing steam at us, you know? Okay, and we're pretending like, there we are, guy, I love oh, yeah. this. Guy had a great haircut. <laughs> dude, you do. I could definitely see if a gay dude rolled up, bro. <laughs> you are toast, Oh, homie. yeah. Yeah, I was Jaffo, just another frustrated, look at that. That guy, I'll that throw a even punch. Look like the same guy. Well, that was a while back, but yeah, no, that's me being the macho guy. But I just had lines in the back of the chopper. He'd say, "Jaffo, incoming, jam him," and I would say, "I am jamming, I am jamming, <laughs> sir." You know, I wanted to be, I wanted to be Richard Pryor or something, or oh, Steve yeah. Martin. I'm in this. Oh, I bet they show. play that at so many bathhouses on loop, dude. <laughs> I am jamming. I am jamming. I am jamming. <laughs> I bet you were on so many. <laughs> you were not getting paid. For I'm this. not jamming, but someone else is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think you need to sell. If you sold tickets in specific areas, man, you would really, really. Crush. But he would call me at night. What are they saying about me? Uh -huh. Well, that you're doing drugs and you're out of your mind. Okay, just checking. <laughs> See you later.
But I got fired. They put me in the helicopter with that suit on, and oh. then they uh, they fired me. They said, come on down. The whole crew was there, mm -hmm. and I had to come down the ladder wearing that. And I didn't think, oh, you're fired. I am now? They could have told me before I got in the monkey suit. <laughs> so I got to do It's like an old show called Brandon. I'm walking across everybody, you know, kind of waving, humiliated. I go to the wardrobe guy, who I kind of befriended. And I'm kind of shook up, and I go, man, I, I'm funny. I can do stuff. And he, and he put his hand on my shoulder like, sure, kid. It's okay, kid, yeah. you know? And then I ran into him after SNL. He goes, God, you, you were right. I didn't fucking, you know? So I got revenge, but that was another crazy. I had some crazy people, you know, experiences, but. Did you ever try out for MacGyver? That makes me think about that, looking at that show and then seeing you. It seemed like they almost would have put you on there. I don't know. At some <clears> point <throat> I stopped because what they did was they were giving me 7,500 a week and I'm from a middle-class family. I was That's a, a lot of boy. money. Yeah, so I was like, doing all this stuff was a waste of time, but in the meantime, I was doing stand-up. So finally, I got, they offered me Funster Hall. It was like a Punky Brewster spinoff. Mm -hmm. So the pilot was gonna be 30,000 in 1984. That's a lot of money. So I just thought, nah, can't do this anymore. So then all I did was clubs. Oh, because you were making too much money touring. Well, I was just in comedy clubs. I was mostly Seattle, Bay Area had like, five full-time clubs wow. so i started going you know i started headlining i was headlining but even bigger rooms and i was i was making plenty of money yeah you know two thousand a week and so i just did that for two years and then i did one final thing that was different was uh, a movie called tough guys with burt lancaster and kirk douglas so they became my buddies that was weird i was the third wheel in that movie kirk douglas is <clears throat> Uh, he just passed. He, he was passed. made to 102. He was the dad, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Kirk Douglas. And I, he talked like this. And he's a ton of great movies. Uh, and Burt Lancaster. These were like, this is like working with Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt oh, yeah. or something. You know, and so. Michael Landon, did you ever work with? No, I, I would love. There we go again. Yeah, look. Look, I was the pro. I was the straight man again. What are you guys doing? I'm telling you, we're going to rob a bank. <laughs> Yeah, they were uh, Kirk Douglas. When he saw me, I go, I play him Richie. Kirk Douglas said, well, you're perfect. You look exactly like Richie. <laughs> and then Burt Lancaster said, how many movies have you done? I go, well, this is my first. You've done one. I've done 72. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the way they talk. You can look it up. <laughs> so look at all this shit I did. It's a different time, huh? But I'm on <laughs> SNL as the church lady eight months later. I mean, I just came so out of crazy. nowhere. What? Yeah. But they were, it was a thrill being around them and listening to them tell the stories. Jack Nicholas had won the Masters golf at age 46, and people thought, and they're like, I had pimples at 46. Hmm. 46 isn't old. <laughs> it's not even, not even middle-aged. <laughs> And they talk like that. And eventually I started doing this thing, which I is politically incorrect, you can cut it out. But just for my own amusement, late night writer's room stuff, I did them as lovers, mm -hmm. you know, Kirk and Bert. And I don't really like blue humor, but I thought their voices would blend so funny. Yeah. And the, the comedy was about the rhythm and the vernacular. <clears throat> I want you, and I want you now. I need to have you. Okay, don't rush me. Two men having fun doesn't mean we're gay. Come on, do what you gotta do. Don't keep bucking around like that, son. I only got so much play down there. You keep bucking around like that, I gotta pull out and splooge all over your backside. So that was the poem that made Lovitz throw up in a parking garage. So I would do 20 minute versions of this for the writer's room. Could you, Burton Kirk? And I did it on an HBO special. But I do it with Lovitz and Lovitz because I would just go so far with it, you know. <laughs> I don't know why I need you, but I want all of it. <laughs> Tonight, you won't. So what I did was then I made it into they're just going to wrestle. And I made some tapes for friends and sent it to Bill Hader. I'd like you to come over to my house. Three, five, nine, Cannon Drive. This is 1952. I'll be there with bells on. There's a gate off the side. The code is seven, five, four pound. We're going to wrestle. We're going to wrestle naked style. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Would you like me to bring anything? Lemonade. Bring me some lemonade. We'll, la <laughs> we'll lather up and then we'll wrestle. First man out of the ring loses. I look forward to it. Just naked. I might be wearing a diaper. 455 Cannon Drive. I'll be there at 4 p.m. Make it 415. 
I gotta get ready for the rhythm. So it's just me having a party with those yeah. rhythms. Because when I do this stuff, I'm the audience in my head too. I'm trying to make myself laugh. So that's uh, I've been canceled oh, three that's times. Right on. That's great to be the audience in your own head. Aren't you a little bit sometimes if you're in a role like oh, yeah. and you're doing bits and it, it's packed and you're rolling and you're doing it a little bit better or a little bit different than you ever have. So you're turning yourself on. Going back to yeah. off the beginning of the podcast, and what did that do? Turns on the audience. You know, if you get to turn yourself on, but um, that's all I'm trying to do all the time. I did Biden last night on Kimmel. Yeah. I was just trying to get get that that feeling of a rhythm that makes is makes makes me laugh. You know. Yeah, and he go on. Come on, let's get real. You kind of not kidding around here. You know, it's like the, the you know we're all well endowed by our creator. And all men, it's the belief that all men are secreted equally with liberty and jump start, jump, jump suits for all man made kind. You're ridiculous, no joke, of race. Crick, 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 clear water, her colored balloons. I, I, I walked on the moon. You know, he yells, walked on the moon with Lance Armstrong. He says, I was uh, Buzz, Buzz, Buzz Lightyear. It was cold and dark. We got home, the grace of God. President Harris was there. I'm Joe Biden. So I was just kind of trying to find a character and a rhythm because Trump is so easy. I'm going to make an announcement soon. You're going to love it. I'm going to say things like you wouldn't believe. And I know how to say things. People don't want me to say it, but I'm going to say it pretty soon. And we're going to do it. And you're going to be happy like you wouldn't believe. So they're just fun, fun rhythms, you know. I, I did one as Obama <clears throat> as a preschool teacher. Mm -hmm. Jack and Jill went up the hill. Jill decided she wanted to become a Jack. And Jack decided he wanted to become a Jill. It's a teachable moment. So anyway, that's all. <laughs> These are just rhythms I'm still working on. I, mean, I did them on Kimball, but I like to do them on Theo Vaughn. Is it? Thank you. It's a nice you gift. Have a, you have a good sense of humor. so it's Sometimes, man, I want to learn how to do one with you real quick. What is like one that you think I could do? Um, Wait, maybe this, some are just sounds. Well, I would say is the Norm quickest hard? one, and these are just these are ad hoc. They're just traditional, is walking. You can just start with that voice. The one I distilled was Christopher Walken sees an amazing magic trick. Mm -hmm. So it's really quick. Christopher Walken sees an amazing magic trick. Wow! 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 You're making three syllables out of one word. Instead of wow, it's wow! Wow! And then, down now! Down now! There you go. Down now, why? Wow, down now, why? <laughs> Well, it's a great character. You should play a hitman that talks like that. Ooh. Gotta kill you. Don't know why. Plug you full of holes. <laughs> no. But he's like, everyone does him. I'm trying to think like a. Oh, I do. You should, you should do Morgan Freeman. Oh, yeah. They said it would take a man 600 years. <laughs> Hold on, let me try it again. <laughs> they said it would take a man 600 years to get out of this here prison. <laughs> but Andy Dufresne did it in less than go. 20. <laughs> That is good. That is very good. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to do. Um, there is fun to throw your voice. Is it you weird? Because some of your friends have died and you still do their voice. Well, I have Dino Stapanopoulos, this great writer. Uh, he Every time one of my impressions dies, he texts me. So when George Bush died, he texts me or Regis Philman, you know. But there's a passage of time. You don't do it the day of. But David and I do Norm because we miss Norm yeah. and we want to do Norm. And we know that Norm would have a twinkle in his eye and would be smiling if he heard us trying to do him, you know? Hey, they, they say a penny saved is like a, what do you call it? Penny earned, right? Yeah, that's like a thousand, that's a hundred percent return. That's like, now you can't get that, right? <laughs> you know? Jack me nimble, Jack me quick, you know? Jump over to Kenny, say, okay, what is he, bipolar? What are you doing over there, you know? He was... Just a brilliant mind. Yeah, and David, he'll do Norm. that one where like David does where Norm too. just describes like he's like, yeah, I'm trying to like, uh, hold on, I'm horrible at this. I'm, uh, well, I'll cue, cue you in. So I'm trying to like, uh, I don't know, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's like a, a thing. It's like I walk through this thing. It's like a, what? It's like a tall rectangle. Like a, <laughs> what is this? And like it's a doorway. <laughs> But like he would just talk about like I'm yeah. in this room and there's just men and there's men peeing in there. I don't even 
I know. Have you he, seen this? Have you guys seen this thing? <laughs> he did a thing, and I don't know if John has talked about this, John Lovitz, but so it's like, yeah, he, he had a gambling issue, right? Hey, John, give me, give me, give me, come on. He did his act, John's going on. Give me $800. I got to go gamble. Come on, you know? So John's like, okay. So the next day, John goes, you know, can I have my $800? He goes, no, I don't have $800. He goes, well, you owe it to me. Why are you so mad? I lost $8,000. You only had lost $800. Why are you so angry? He just turned it on him. And John was like, John, Norm would always fuck with him and say, I'm a better stand. No, he goes, I'm a better stand up than you, you know? I'm like a better stand up than you are. He goes, I've been done it longer and love it so get so mad. Excuse me. Yeah. You know? Well, you owe it to me. That's yeah. a best that he you does that. Oh, yeah. John has his own character. He doesn't even know where it came came from hello <laughs> um but yeah as far as the 90s thing which you asked is so i did two shitty movies for three million dollars each they were terrible i shouldn't have done them i just didn't know what i was doing i came off with too much heat i had wayne's world uh, pro bush uh carson i was oh, doing killing, yeah. all this stuff came together so i had too much heat and i didn't really know what to do as a middle class kid because now it wasn't 30 i was three million and I hated it so much. I said, then I had two other offers, pay or play. Hans and Franz, The Girly Man Dilemma, but we wrote it with Arnold. He dropped out. So I didn't want to do that. Bob Odekirk and I wrote a, a Western called Tucson for me and John Lovitz. Oh. That John with that fell out. And so I and that was three million pay or play. But I was okay to get rid of that. They tried to put us together in Bad Boys. Another three million pay or play. But then the script just wasn't right. And I it was a hot oven at that point for me. So I I got out of that. So then I just sort of stopped. And then I had two kids, but it wasn't it. Then they went along and then I did the variety show. I did a special mm -hmm. and then I did the variety show mm -hmm. uh, with, you know, with Louis C.K. And, you know, Carole. Yeah, you and guys had great, great writers on that. Great show. It did just you was, pick the writers? Was, well, Smigel was, it was, he, you know, I, I interviewed Louis C.K. You know, he was brilliant then. And uh, we had, we had an A team for sure. When so. you decided to like take a, so was it a decision to take a break or was it just like, this kind of feels what I should do? Was it like specifically to kind of be a parent? Was it to make sure that like. There was, there was some of that. We moved up to Northern California. I was also sort of disillusioned, you know, cause the movie thing, once you make those two things and they stick to you, then you're just in a hole to dig out of in a way. Oh, that's what but it when feels I, like. If huh? I'd done, I had Hans and Franz, The Girly Man Dilemma and others that I was working on. I just made, it's just a misstep. I always think of big life, big mistakes. It's okay to have regrets. But then at that point, I could make a fortune in stand-up. Right. So I could work, I would take two months off at Christmas. I would take the summers off. So I could be a present dad and, and make a shit ton of money, and especially corporate dates. I didn't want to do them. So they'd say this much. I'd say, no, I don't want to do it. And they go, well, how about this much? No, I don't want to do it. Then they'd say this much. I go, and a private jet? I still don't want to do it. Okay, what kind of <laughs> private jet? Uh, Gulfstream? Okay. So then I started doing those interstitially. Yeah. So I was able to take care of everybody financially, but uh, I was in no man's land. I was untethered. But, you know, fr fame was not something that, I was, I'm, I'm kind of like other, there's a, there's mo some of us where fame didn't quite settle with us. Like it's scary. Other, some people embrace it and love it and I don't judge that at all or very easy with it. For me, I'm kind of an introverted extrovert. So being famous was not, it was a very odd thing. The money was fun and the creativity is fun, but the fame part, you know, I don't know. So. Yeah, it's kind of scary. But that's how I navigated that. I just throw those numbers out so people know. Because my wife, so I was doing stand-up a while back and I would just tease the crowd and go, I know you're thinking like, why am I here? It's like 20 seats in, in the valley. And, and I go, I, I, I know me too, but I'm a millionaire and stuff like that. So, cause you don't want people to go, oh, he was so big and now he's poor. So yeah. it was never a problem. And um, now it's just full circle. Everything's real in, in real time for me. And so this, this weird place thing is just super fun. Fly on the wall with David is super fun. I mean, so I'm just having complete creative fun with both those things. I'm not frustrated. I'm not in a shitty movie or stupid TV show. Yeah. You know, I'm doing my own thing now, you know. What was it like watching your kids be funny? What did you, like, was it, what was it like <laughs> watching your son, like, was that kind of interesting having had your own relationship with your own dad and your brothers and stuff? Mm -hmm. What was it like when you were a dad and then you had a couple of boys? Like, what was some of that kind of like? 
Um, well, we just had we just had a lot of fun. We had a lot of games. You know, they were just game for anything. We do things like um, on a rainy day, set up an obstacle course around the house and time them. Yeah, and they'd run. They did the classic like massive pillow, uh, massive. Well, we did the pillow throw. It was called the. And so they would, I get all the pillows from the couch and they would run across on the carpet and I would try to get them under their feet and fall. And they loved, the, they loved all the games, you know, uh, the hide and go daddy, which they would go in the room and they would hide. I knew where they were, but I would creep around and go, I don't really know where they are this time. You hear the closet door shaking, <laughs> you know, so they're, they, and they have their own friends and their own humor, uh, even as little kids, they were, you know, but we, um. We just had a lot, a lot of fun. A lot. Of, they had a child of a freedom up there in Northern California suburbs. Kids could just go out a lot more, and you know, sort of. So, I don't know. Dex can jump on the mic on this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of. I guess I'm just kind of curious. You know, I guess we just of had what a lot like. of fun. We watched a lot of movies, had a lot of rituals, and you know, we went to on vacation a lot to Montana, a lot, and we just were in Montana, and it very nostalgic. You know, for Dex and Tom to be up there in Montana, right, Dex? Oh, it's the best state. Unbelievable. Was Fred Wolf up there or not? Not at that time, but he's up there all the time, yeah. too. Yeah. You, if you go to Flathead Lake in August and you catch a nice day, it's like Tahoe. No one's on the lake and the water is just temperate in the mountains. I mean, it's a magic place, northwestern Montana, Missoula, where I was born. And where we were this summer, I mean, tubing and stuff on, a, on just on an yeah. incredible motorboat. Right, Dex? I, it was the best. Two and behind a bow is, is my is the, one of the best things on the planet. Dex, whenever you was was it like whenever was there ever competition with you and your brother to like make your dad laugh? Were you guys like kind of funny? Was it? I'm just trying to think of like what it's like to have humor like with your father. I never had like moments with my dad where we made each other laugh that I can remember or anything. I think I was just too young. So I guess I'm just uh, and maybe there's no correlation. I didn't have it with my dad either. Um, most of the time, I think I was a regular dad. I, you know, I wasn't always doing voices and characters, right, Dex? But well, when we were doing, when you were working up for your special, and we were, you let Tom and I go on the road with you. That that would get a little competitive, you know, because uh, Tom and I would be open for you. So if, you know, Tom like mm -hmm. just crushed. Yeah, I'd be like oh man, I got the. <laughs> oh, so Tom, you know, the brothers are doing stand up, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's yeah, we. Had, but I would just say we just had a lot of fun. My wife, who likes a very tidy home, just gave them full run of it most of the time. You know, the airsoft battles where there's a million pellets and yeah. their cousins would come over and couches and they'd be in there fighting for hours, <laughs> loading up. And, you know, I couldn't watch them. They'd be on skateboards going down a steep hill. So my mind was too active on that thing. But my, my wife could watch them go down the hill. And, you know, they had a... They had a very free childhood in a lot of ways, don't you think, Dex? X great, get you know, bike riding. Oh, I couldn't ask for more fun. They had yeah, a lot of independence. Awesome. Yeah. North, yeah, uh, North Bay, Mill Valley. Just yeah. a little Steven Spielberg town. Wow. And Julian cool. Julian Madalich was there too. And now with full circle, here they are working on this thing years cool. later. Isn't that funny? The weird place, which what we're always in. We're all always in the weird place, man. It's such a twilight zone, life is. Yeah, it really is. It's it to touch reality is sort of because I feel like your dreams are and your memories are very similar, you know. You dream something, but if like you try to like hold it in your brain, you in fourth grade or something, it's it's kind of in that place where you would hold a dream, you know? So it's sort of elusive, isn't it? Did yeah. that really happen? <laughs> you know, in fourth grade when we would cuz you're you're remembering it just in images in your head when we skip the rocks. And I beat my brother that time. You know, I hit yeah. it six, six skips. You know, skipping rocks was a pretty cool thing. Skipping rocks is a, it's still a conquistadorian of, event if you can get, if you can get into it and do it well. It, yeah, I miss the days when things were a lot more simpler and things would be like, I remember walking down the street, somebody invited somebody, their family is somebody had died over there and they buried them in their yard, right? To do what insurance money. Cause they weren't going to tell anybody and get that check. Wow. So me, quite... and, me and my buddy Summerall are walking down the street, and next thing you know, we get invited to a damn funeral. So we're in the backyard at the oh wow at these folks' house, and they're burying the damn grandfather in there in the ground. And then we'd go back there and play kickball and shit back there. And he was shit. in the ground for like probably eleven months before the cop they figured it out. You know, some 
you know. Wow, that's that's extraordinary. A cadaver buried in the yard. And we had to do a. I remember where they said, "Does anybody want to say a great uh, say anything?" Right? And my buddy, he said, "Grace," like you say at dinner or something. He didn't know what to do. I guess we were just children. Wow. And he said, "God is great. God is good. God, we thank you for this food." And I'm like, "This is a fucking." <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the, we're standing there by the end like of the vibe. Yeah. That was so well, we weird. were, Scott and I were in the good time, though. pet cemetery team under the willow tree. So the animals. Oh, y'all were burying them out there, huh? So you almost had a little bit of land, huh? Well, no, a quarter acre. There was a willow tree. Damn, whoa. And That's a little close to be burying a well, dead animal, bro. Well, we. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, where else are we gonna do with them? Take them to the dump? I don't give a damn if you don't have a half acre, bro. You don't. No, we it. we it was it was a short. You know, boots got rigor mortis in the in the laundry room out in the garage, so we can't go. We're touching boots, and boots like so. Boots has ants, ants, ants coming in his mouth, and he's 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 kind of stiff. We're oh, not yeah. quite That's a Japanese sure he's thing, I think. not sure he's dead. <laughs> yeah. So we get the shovel and we're bringing boots down to the pet cemetery, the willow tree. And we dig the hole and drive. We put boots in. We both heard. We thought we heard. <laughs> and we go. I go. What should we do? He goes. Hey, he's gone her anyway. <laughs> so we <laughs> buried it. And Tiger and then Peppy. Peppy got run over. My brother Mark was sort of not a good driver, so he backed up overhead. She took a nap oh. under the tire. We came out. Peppy, uh -huh. <laughs> poor Peppy. It was a little cute little poodle. The head was all flattened out, but. He said he never felt a bump, but oh. Scott and I got the shovel. This time it was a no, it wasn't a question mark. We're down there right next to the boot. <laughs> you know, so we buried a lot of stuff. Anyway, no, but yeah, we had a kind of a suburban, but it was low population, a lot of open land. Yeah. And so a lot of getting in hollowed out trees and smoking cigarettes. Oh yeah, Boo Radley and out there. Yeah, man. getting in the hollow tree and getting sometimes getting stuck in it, you know? And uh, and fights, fist fights, and headlocks. You know, cut it out, cut yeah. it out. You know, a lot of just like shoot. my brother got through a dart and like stuck stuck in my leg, and I had to pull it out. Oh. You know, but anyway, it's real shit. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's just there's a there's a, we have a the sim symbiotic. Yeah, kind of I remember childhood. a guy borrowed some money off me one time to buy drugs, right? And I didn't know he was buying it for him and his mother or whatever, but. Mm. I went down there a couple of weeks later to get my money back. You know, I'd loaned it to him like $2 and 50 cents and I needed it. You know, holidays were coming up and all of that. And so I went under their property and they had like 11 people lived in like a house this big as this room. And there was people sleeping in the sink and I was so mm. scared to ask for the money. And then him and his mom started fighting about drugs. And next, you know, mm. they're fist fighting in the yard. You know, and I was like, oh, y'all can just keep the money. I mean, they're just beating each other's <laughs> teeth in. Jesus, we had the Casson brothers, and their mom was like 28 or something, you yeah. know, and she was divorced. She was a tough br chick, but she was never around. And Johnny Casson, Jimmy Casson was bigger. I had fist fights with both of them, you know, and I would take five to get in one roundhouses. Yeah. I was 90 pounds. And, and then Jimmy beat up Johnny was over there. And Johnny came out of the kitchen. He got every every sharp knife in the kitchen. He was holding him like this. He couldn't even throw him. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> and he had like 10 knives. <laughs> <laughs> the Casson brothers, they were the other side of the tracks, yeah. even though we didn't have train tracks there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Mom, Mama was horny. Her, their mother was just horny. She was horny? Oh, dude, we had that lady. I think I told you the other night, my mom got a dang Dodge Neon, right? And it was so nice. Mm. And my brother would go, my brother and I, my brother Zeph and I would go sleep in it at night. Just because it was cool. Oh, I get it was just the, the, it had plush interior. Yeah. It had, uh, it just smelled like something new. Yeah. You know, and we'd be in there, God, just smelling, just, just smelling as much A newness new as we could. Smell. Oh, God. And yeah. we'd fall asleep in there. And then this lady, we had this lady that lived a couple apartments down and she'd always play, she'd be out there one time and she was, getting railed by some guy on the on the fucking new car on the against the side of it dude wow. my brother and i my brother and i woke up and s this lady she was <laughs> always out there kind of touching herself and fucking huffing you know not paint but something and um and then we just felt the car shaking <laughs> dude and we fucking... it's funny to go by people having sex we run cross country in high school and this couple's on the trail yeah it's like, hey, let me buy but as far as the car my dad had a british never we always had used cars but it was a hillman it was a nice British sedan. Mm. And my brother Scott, the guy who ran over Peppy, he was like 18. So he went to some baseball thing, hot dog jamboree. And later on, we found out he had 10 Heinekens. 
So he drove the car home. He had had 10 Heinekens, and then he got hungry, so he had pink popcorn. He had two big things of pink, and I don't know how he made it home, but he came in, and he was so fucking drunk. My dad goes, you drunk? So he's sitting on the bed. I was like, God. So my dad's doing roundhouse left and right. Well, he broke his wrist on his skull, probably the first two punches. He wore a cast, and we had to say, we couldn't say why. My mom's saying, you're killing him, you're killing him. But he didn't feel anything. So Scott and I were the team. We had to clean up the pink popcorn covered oh. all over the front of the hillman the only thing worse than that is when the whole neighborhood's toilets backed up in our downstairs toilet no it just started flowing out because the downstairs brothers had just a toilet down there mm -hmm. no sink and started flowing out so we were in charge so scott and i were the bucket brigade so it was poo and shit and water going and out not the just y'all's everybody's all just not ours just the whole neighborhood it was just not all ours they Damn. just came and it was flowing up, and it's we're like bailing. The worst power ball. Brad had a a drill because it, it was it was starting to rise up. Ooh. So he was could have electrocuted himself, but he he was drilling, and then he went under the house and was drilling holes for the water to drain. And my mom was screaming to. He was under the house drilling holes for the water drain because yeah. the plumbing was yeah. loading up in the. Well, because it was filling up the room, and oh. we were bailing as fast as we can. Just shit, just like we were really good athletes at the time. We were fit, but just like for hours. And my mom was screaming. And were you we throwing it out the window? We were throwing it out the window, and we'd even grab shit and throw it out the window. We were just, just we, loose we had, hand and do well, or buckets or grabbing. We got just in a frenzy oh. because we just we were trying to stop it. If you got a loose handed dookie of a stranger, I don't know if there's any <laughs> other. I mean, you should have a. Well, nursing. we had every texture that day. We had kind of milky. We had really solids. We had two double solids. We had we had every kind of feces going out that thing. Oh, yeah. We learned a lot about the human anatomy God. and gastrointestinal stuff. Yeah, but these are all true stories. I couldn't even tell you. I mean. There's a lot. Oh, it's good. It's fun. These we had some rough and tumble. You, you know, know what I remember about a lot of people don't remember. Like I, I'll hang out with my best friends from growing up, and they don't remember a lot of the stuff that happened. That's the interesting thing. I'm like, well, you're kind of jogging my memory because of you, the, the car and all these things. A lot of you people know. just don't remember it. I don't know if they didn't weren't paying as enough attention, or I think I was hyper aware as a kid too. I think as comedians, you get hyper aware. Because you're really alert and sensitive to what's going on. That's good for a comedian is to be observant and really be a sensitive instrument, I call it. Yeah. And so it's almost a form of light form of Asperger's. You don't want to look at the light too much because everything's so intense, you know. And uh, I just remembered all of it, you know. I just yeah. said because it was, and there were some just lazy moments too. But there was one time where I just got incredibly lucky and it was almost a spooky day at this cab weird cabin in Montana. Well, they had a slot machine in there. You know, mm -hmm. it had all dimes in it. Mm -hmm. And so I started getting- and You were a child or an adult? I was a child. I was oh. like eight. Scott oh, was 10. Yeah. I started hitting jackpots. No. Oh. And it's like, and then he'd do it. And then I, I kept hitting jackpots. Then we were playing poker and we had these chips and I kept getting perfect hands. It was this day where I was just incredibly lucky for this day. Like yeah. I couldn't lose. Couldn't lose. It went back to the little, and it was dimes coming out. He gets like, you know, one cherry, gets a dime, like three cherries. So that was kind of a mystical day. You know, yeah. Things when you're young have so much. Like even if you win, you win seven dimes. It's like, remember when this happened? Or oh yeah. I remember we we were going to the movies and we found a busted open Coke machine and somebody had been trying to rob it and like Jimmy'd open and they'd ran off. Obviously, right as yeah. the money was falling out. And I walked up and oh, there was yeah. all this money and a watch. You could see the robber that had reached in there. Would his watch had come off. So suddenly, it had me a nice watch and as much money as you could think of. I bro. loved it. That was my God addiction damn. to shoplifting. You know, I would go in when I finally got caught. Like I had a special billowy coat and a special secret pocket in the back. And so I, I was like in this drugstore and I'd been shoplifting like crazy, you mm -hmm. know, shopping candy, everything. And I got this top that you would spin and I put it in there and I'm on my bike. And right as I was getting away, the guy grabbed the back of it. So then my brothers, you know, they were the ones who got me into shoplifting. They would stick stuff yeah, down my, deviants. they would stick stuff down my pants. But then I, you know, I was shamed by that. I, yeah. they, I took the fall. They didn't say, we were shoplifting too. And we used to stick oh. stuff down his pants. We taught him how to do it. They didn't say anything. They stayed quiet. Damn. So my dad came in and I thought, okay, here it comes. You know, snap the belt. But then he goes, oh, Jesus Christ, you brought shame to the family. Oh. But I didn't really feel that. I thought bullshit. <laughs> I thought, come on, they were all shoplifting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, we're halfway through the podcast. No, we're going to take a break. And no, I'm sorry. We've, we've probably done we've pretty probably good. Talked. How long have we been? Two hours? Oh, Jesus Jesus Christmas, man. Seriously, really? Yeah, I didn't realize we kept you in here that you long. You put it in two parters or? No, we'll do a one parter, man. 
Okay. Um, and yeah, I want to. I wonder if they'll let us play a clip from your show. Do you think they will? Which I mean the weird place? from the weird place. They can play yeah. anything they want. They brought a couple clips. Yeah, I got a clip. You um, want to play it? Yeah. yeah. Which one is it? I'll set it up. Uh, you guys were saying. Uh, Psycho Bill. Psycho Bill. Okay, Psycho this is Bill. this. This submarine crew goes back in time to the pirate ship. Okay, and then they interact with them, and they figure out they've gone back in time. And they go on a, a tour of the pirate ship okay. to show them everything. And they go to the brig and they meet this especially potent prisoner. Okay. And the captain, McKinley from 1966, is a little thrown by it. And this is their conversation. He's behind the bars. Okay. Are you sure that cell will hold it? Well, I could never break out. Not with these balls made of fine Spanish steel. Now. Who is this oddly attired gentleman? I'm Captain McKinley of the United States Navy. Navy man? Something... Something strange about you. What is that sweet fragrance I smell? It's a deodorant. Deodorant. Never heard of it. Huh. This guy's starting to give me the creeps. So there's a little, it's, it's you know, the filmic music, the sound effects, like the slapping the bar <laughs> and the effect on my voice. We played around with that forever. I was doing Hannibal Lecter. I was doing all. And then these guys pitched it down. And I said, oh, God, that's the guy. Uh, that's our that's our bad guy. Yeah, yeah. That's Psycho Bill. Who is this right here? Yeah. That What's music? that sweet fragrance I smell? Yeah. Uh, deodorant. Never heard of it. You're a Navy man. Something strange about you. Oh, oh yeah. You know, it's you almost sexual. like somebody's a, just bought a new cat. <laughs> Do we have another one? Do we have the ant one or no? Yeah, I got it. Okay, here is like the guy who gets the magic <laughs> power with the globe. These bullies shit on him. He says, he says, I'll fight you in an abandoned lot outside of town. Then he goes to the globe and he sees an ant and he puts an ant on the globe. And it's magic globe. Yeah. So he drops it on the lot they're at. And they're just waiting to fight him. And this giant ant comes out of the sky. And these bullies have to fight the ant. Oh, so here's, nice. what it's, here's a piece of it. There's okay. a lot longer, but yeah. Go. Look at those legs! That ant can Coming out of the sky. That belly, it's a giant ant! Oh no, we gotta fight this thing! Keep your feet moving, boys! <laughs> Man, I don't like that ass. Get the shotgun out of the truck! So they're fighting for their life. Wow. Just to give you a sound collage. That, who made the ant noise? Did they uh, we, they did it. it. They did effects. I did some practical effects where we oh we, God, we layered so in. so much fun. Layered in a ton of effects. I've been, Julian, what'd you do, man? What'd you do to Julian, help out? I yeah. want to know a little bit more. He did here. all the oh, stuff yeah. decks. They were partners. Yeah, Lennon we and McCartney. Like, we kind of lay down some initial effects with our just voices and whatnot or find some stuff on YouTube. And then yeah. we would send it out to our to our mixer guy we were kind of collaborating with and he'd help us sort of build How it exciting out. are the moments whenever you kind of like, okay, yeah. let's redo it again, but then you realize how much you raised the bar on it. You're well, like, that, oh my God. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Look and how we, much more we can do. That's why we kept doing it. And those guys went downtown with that ant thing. And we kept doing did it. The, and doing did the Carvies it. gang up on you any, Julian, or do you feel like you had? Were you afraid to be the? <laughs> uh, you're obviously the odd person out, and there's yeah, nothing you can do about that. That's you know there's genetic. Not much, but no, we, we, we all grew up together. We had a hole cut cut in our back fence, and we had a tin can phone and whatnot. Oh, so we, yeah, dude. we go so way they were, back. They were they yeah. know each other. He's like a brother from another mother. I mean, they're like thick as thieves, and they have so much shared experience. I met Julian when he was three. God, what was he like then? He was he was about uh, he was pretty pretty cocky. Really, he had diapers on, but he had an no. He was just a cute little kid, shirtless, maybe. probably, huh? Probably just strolling around the neighborhood. Yeah, drinking out of a tit. That's cocky as you can get, dude. And his dad's from Mississippi. So oh, that's, really? That was, you yeah, know, I was I was baptized in Mississippi. Actually. Oh, damn, yeah. baby, that's what's up. Yeah, dude, I saw. Uh, I used to work over there, and. Uh, I had to paint a fence one time, right, with this fella, Big Johnny, and he was a homoerotic guy, right? And they didn't, 
you know, and he would wear uh, big chains and stuff, yeah. and he had a big afro, and he would drive on a riding lawnmower all the time, and he and I had to paint this white fence, and the birds, all these, uh, I think they were nightingales, maybe, mm. would come and try to get into his hair. And so my job <laughs> while I, we were painting, I had a badminton racket and just to whack them all day, bro. <laughs> so that was your job? Yeah, we were out there. I started painting, but by the, maybe about an hour in, he couldn't handle the pressure of the nature. So what, 60 cents an hour and you're just whacking birds with a tent? Oh, I was doing pretty, I was getting paid five bucks an hour, but I was out there. I probably, Woo! dude, I, I bet I took 30 sparrows off that dude's brim that day, man. I mean, because his hair was just, wow. they wanted a nest in it. But did you wound them and then they'd fly away or did you really whack them dead? I'd say probably 40, 40, 50 or 40, not 40, 50, 50, 50. Wow. Birds are intense. Yeah, it depends. I mean, well, the problem with birds is they're coming out of the sky and you don't know what's going on up there. That's what I find. Right. We have Animals, some, you get a little bit more. You get the, you, they run up, you get the ambiance. But a bird, you're like, fuck, you know. We have some koi fish on our farm slash ranch and they're inside this cement. It, it came with the house, but they built it so like the bald eagles or whatever's up there because most of the people come over and go, I can't believe they're still alive. And they're big. They're like 40 pounds and they'll live to like 110. Koi will? Yeah. They'll live way past us. They're like vegetables that float around. I mean, they go around in circle on a five foot thing and they're fascinated for a hundred years. Damn. But anyway, he said that the, the birds intuitively know they could get them with their tail on, is that it? But they wouldn't, they don't have enough runway to get out because <gasps> oh. they'd hit the Buddha statue. Damn. So they're safe for now. They're safe for now, yeah. baby. Safe I'm, for now. I think we all, we're all, that's all we all we're are, We're all man. safe. Uh, how do we close this, Theo? I, I, this has been so much fun. I really told you a, a lot of, stuff no look i'm just <laughs> i think it's interesting i've heard some about your life i think it's nice that you're getting to work on a project that you know with family obviously family is something that's been very important to you and so i think that's super to me that's really cool man like you know i talk about doing stuff with my brother there's a lot of people who'd give anything yeah. to be able to do a job with their dad no matter what it is you know and uh, like um especially yeah. to make something like this that almost anybody could really make like of course people aren't gonna have oh, the no, same people, talents people make them but we know that you got it, there's a whole new level you need to go to. You can't just write a script, get some voice actors, and add a couple effects. Right. You need to win the war every moment for right. the attention span. You need every single moment. That's why we made it kind of like an album. Yeah. You know, uh, rather than just something to get something else. Hey, maybe someone will buy it and we'll make a lot of money. Yeah. You know, we actually said, no, we want to conquer this space. And those guys, uh, they were writing with me at the table, they were directing me. Um, they were doing rewrites and they were doing the editing and they were stacking the effects and working with Ben and, you know, it's just, and choosing music, bringing in the music and the music inspired me, Yeah, you know, and the right oh, scary yeah, music sure. for Psycho Bill or what's the music. And we had the, that library. So we, we were able to make it filmic as you can see by these samples. Oh yeah. So, well, it also does that thing for me. It brings back your imagination. Like, that's it. Suddenly yeah. my imagination has yeah. to work and it's almost excited. And I don't mean that any dad and son could do this or any dad and family and friends can do this or any group. Anybody could, you could make something fun with your family. You could do something yeah. with the but, tools available. You can make cool, right, stuff. you can make really cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. But also obviously you guys are trying to get it at a level out there where it's like, you know, you want to put a piece of art out into the world. And I think it's interesting that you didn't burn yourself out over the years. So you still have the, ver a little bit of the veracity or concern or whatever to want to do something like this. I, a lot changed. of people get burnt. I mean, yeah. there are people that, you know, do 20 things that they don't want to do for years and they um, get burnt out, you know? So. My other son watched The Time Machine with Rod Taylor, Obsessed, which I showed him as a little kid and he's possessed by it. So art and music, my family with the Beatles and movies, just everything to us. Making art, uh, doing it. I like to think that because of my cross country and track, I've kept my VO2 max really strong. Yeah. <laughs> like I don't think anyone in Hollywood could hike up a hill with me. I don't really think so. If they could, but I'm going past like, uh, they're all in the slow lane. So you could beat Neil and Easy on his little. Well, yeah, I don't want to pick on him. I'm thinking of you and me, mano a mano. I'm looking oh, at 30 years young. He's but got anyway. lungs on him. Does your dad have some good lungs on him, Dex? Wow. Well, I've just never stopped. I need it for my mental health. I mm -hmm. love playing the guitar. Like I do it for an hour every night, making up shit. And I need the the breaking the sweat with the pulse. I love it. So, but I do think the core energy and passion for me, and I'm just surprised. I mean, it sounds so self congratulatory, but I care just as much about this as anything I've done. 
anything. It doesn't matter to me. When something was kind of shitty. Tell. You can it, tell. If something's popular, okay, I might like it. But, well, you can tell by hearing, right? You just tell. Because that it, the amount of layering that went into it and the amount of sound collage and just finding Psycho Bill and writing the part and what do they say? I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Blink in your brain when you hear that voice. I could never escape. What do you picture? Um, Psycho Bill, you mean? Yeah. I picture a big, uh, oh, you know what? You say, no, well, it, it can now be I wonder if, I'm, if my brain's taking over. I picture uh, <laughs> a little bitty guy. <laughs> with the biggest wiener you've ever fucking seen. <laughs> a human tripod. I mean, he's got, no, he has to wear it over his shoulder in a bag. Yeah, he uses it as a weapon. But he doesn't even talk about it. It's just, yeah. you don't really know that. Okay. And he has the biggest, thickest, darkest mustache you've ever fucking See, seen. See, that's the thing. That is your psycho bill. Yeah. That's your psycho bill. So that it, you- And you he could get out of the prison easy. He could literally just walk through the bars if he wanted. Well, there's stuff that happens. But he stays in there because it's just- it's Well, he he's, he, things happen in the storyline. There's stuff that happens with the other sailors and there's some illicit stuff that's going yeah, on. Yeah, good. So, you know, that that's the, the great thing about this. If you're driving around as a mom with your kids and it's and nothing you else You can listen going, to it with family. You can listen and to let kids. them imagine the story. Ooh. Let them decide what Captain McKinley looks like or- Ca Captain Jack, you know, who I worked after my wife's Irish uncle. Am I going to talk like that? And we just call him Captain Jack. So all the characters have some some reason or some way I found my way to them. There's a character called Smarty Wiggins, a pirate. Uh -huh. And I base it off this Irish woman, Noni, who talks sort of like this, but he's the smartest pirate in the world. <laughs> and he invents the toilet. And he goes, I call it... A lavatory. Because he's, he's a genius pirate. But that was coming from Noni's voice. Mm. God rest her soul. She went to the stars. God damn. That's what my father used to say all the time. Oh, really? God damn God it. God damn. <laughs> and he would like. <laughs> Just randomly. Yeah, we'd wake him up and he'd be like, God damn it. <laughs> it was that's like all I remember him saying most of my life, dude. And then he would like have some beers. He would. Oh, he would take me to the bar with him and he'd tell me to go walk down the bar and come back, you know? Well, my dad used to- And literally walk down the bar and I'd walk down it with all the people's glasses on and stuff. And oh, it be, walk I down think, and get a beer for him? Or, or just, just walk down it and come back. You know, when you're mm. little, it's a long bar. You know, when you're four or five, oh, yeah. it's a pretty long bar. But it's bar. all nasty stuff. A bar right, is so illicit. Yeah. You know, reaching in and getting a little popcorn or a snack oh, nut. Yeah. And you're, you know, w jumping over this glass and, you it's know, dark having in to there. conversate with people. It's almost, maybe that's how I got on stage first. I didn't even think about that. Well, but God, I had to walk, yeah. so now I'd go walk the bar for him down there and the lady would be down there she'd give me a little christmas candy even if it was out of season she'd have a little cup of christmas candy and he just wanted you to walk down just to see what it was just like to get off his nerves for about 30 seconds oh just go walk around for a bit yeah go walk down the bar each wow. time because it's hard to get down the bar if you walk down the floor it's wide open but the bar there's mm. deviants you got a damn fucking pedophile you got a couple fist fighting there you know you got a guy picking his nails you know and giving it to you or whatever <laughs> You know, you got a lot of... Uh, and you have a great memory. You got people to meet along the so way. So you paint pictures with your brain. Because I'm imagining man. this bar now. Oh, And yeah. imagining 10-year-old Theo. Tony Padoni's, it was called. Tony Padoni's. And then my dad was like, we're going to ride. We're going to, all right, we're going to head home. And he, we'd sit in the car, like, we're going to leave in just a minute. And then he'd fucking fall asleep. Mm. And I'd just be fucking sitting there in the fucking And waiting car. for him to yeah. wake up. Yeah. Oh, my dad would, when I was in junior, I was the last kid there. He'd give me an enema kit because he was too embarrassed to go buy one. Oh. Oh, oh, Jesus Christ, Dane. This is this is my best. This is how we talk. Oh, could you give me one of these? And it's something funny. Because I was buying the enema kit for him, oh. no embarrassment. Yeah. Even though they might be going, <laughs> what? You, you, you're you that constipated? You're 18? You weigh 110 pounds? Jesus, kid. But I know, okay, just give me the enema kit. Jesus <laughs> Christ. But he, he did take us to the Kit Kat Club in Idaho Falls. Oh, that's nice. And it was illicit. It was dark and kind of nasty. Your father took you in there? He took us in there. The drink we, to get you a drink? No, we were just driving up to Montana. My mm. sister went with my mother who went on a plane. And so we drove up. But just the, the bar scene as a young, the darkness yeah. of it. Because when I worked at Holiday Inn as a busboy and I'd go to, or a waiter, I'd go into the bar to get drinks in the afternoon. And then there'd be like, a parent of one of my friends would be in there just getting blasted. He'd see me and he'd kind of look down 
And then I did room service. I waited on Michael Jackson. I waited on Little Richard. He was naked. I waited Little on- Little Richard was? And did he see He answered the door erotic? naked. And was homo erotic. Well, there was a man in the bed with okay. sheets over. So and he, he answered the door naked. That seems pretty gay, I think. I think it's gay. And he goes, have you been to the show? Because he was playing the Circle Star and you Theater. were a child. Huh? You were I was 18, 19. You've been to the show? And I, I did, you know, I just, I waited on Richard Pryor, waited on, um, you know, Carlin, waited on Rich Little. Stuff like that. And wow. those are whole other stories. But, yeah. you know. but anyway, so Theo. Um, I think we're okay, man. I think we got enough. We spent a lot of time together, man. Well, it just flowed really nice because I do this now. <laughs> so Yeah, I know you do this, this now for is, a job. Is, This was really fun and easy. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, me you too, know, man. I really I'm, did. Uh, I mean, I kind of broke a sweat a little bit. It's but good. I think I'm okay. I think it counts as a workout. No, I'm good. Well, just, you get a, you know, you just sort of get, it's exciting just sharing these stories and, the way we were bouncing off each other because your stuff just keep it was inspiring me. Oh, thanks. Because I'm like oh, the new car, the brother, or the thing, or the guy with one toe or whatever. It's like, oh man, okay, oh, we had something kind of like that too. Yeah. So we were we were kind of hillbillies from the middle class white suburbs, basically up there in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah, I bet it, I think it's interesting. I think there's just so many commonalities. I, I, but I love remembering things from the past. I think it's pretty fascinating. I love imagination. And yeah, I think stuff like this is good. Stuff like um, the weird the place. weird place is great for people because yeah, it'll help it, it just to get you to go. Especially moms knowing or dads knowing that they could listen to it with their kids. See, yeah, hey, what do your kids think? Throw it on, you know. Oh yeah, and then we we have some uh, emotionality, like I said, in it. Nothing heavy handed, but there's some sweetness to it and earnestness to it. And it th we were doing thinking of this before Ted Lasso, which I think that struck a nerve too. We love the dark stuff, and you know, but there's something about earnestness mm -hmm. and sincerity and we loved going back into that 60s vibe and they're all evergreen they could play a thousand years from now if there'll still be submarines and um so we just love it and um just feel very lucky was there ever a chance like looking back on some of your like prime days when you were working on snl and you got to work yeah. with so many unique people yeah and in a time when they let characters really develop and yeah and reoccur and you had your catchphrase and, God, <laughs> yeah it was so it was so much fun um was there ever a chance you guys would try to get back to i've always wondered why didn't like five or six of the guys say hey let's do this again let's just make our own thing and do it it's you know it you step and that's up. an outsider's perspective you know no i know and you always think oh but then you're kind of like oh, how do you get back to sketch you know me doing yeah. these voices and improvising these rhythms was exercising that same idea and there's a freedom without an audience you know you don't want to be indulgent but you can also step outside yourself but yeah it it's a magic thing that's why spade and i's podcast is popular it's a reality show the people We'll laugh and we'll have a good time, but there's an emotional underpinning to that shared story of getting this incredible lucky break. You're with your friends, or I call them your bandmates. You're all getting a little money. You're getting a little famous and you're all doing it together and you're live in Rockefeller Center way up in the sky in the middle of the night and there's horses and dwarfs on the show and people are juggling and you're falling down and all kinds of shit going on. And so it's something that's a, it's a, it's a, dr a fever dream kind of in a way, yeah. but getting back to it is, is very tough. There's other ways to do it. You know, um, I think I had a podcast a while back where I was doing long form riffs. It was called fantastic. It's still out there where I would just take flight of fancies and go for 10 minutes. Cause that's what I would do backstage. Kevin and I would do Hans and Franz for like an hour. Yeah, you'll lose. A, I'm a lo we were just cocking that voice for an Until hour. Until you found good moments. Yeah, and then we'd have to repeat it on. But our best moments, we would just fall yeah. and giggling and, you know, just by, you, you know. The that, moment. You can't, that moment, it's so nice. When Kevin said, and if you don't think we're properly pumped up men, you know, the defensiveness of Hans and Franz, we could very <laughs> easily come to your house, stretch the flab of your back into the shape of a rope ladder so you could crawl down into the sewer because that's where losers live. <laughs> to me, it's poetry. It may be my favorite rhythms. And the guys who never lift anything, they're terribly wounded, terribly insecure. They have this stupid show and they're just trying to get back at imaginary enemies. They think the audience doesn't think they're macho. Yeah. And I could very easily, you're lucky. <laughs> your buttocks are like marshmallows. You're lucky I don't have a campfire here. <laughs> don't undo your belt. You might cause a flabber lunch. 
You put, tell your muscles are so flabby. I like to shape them in a bowl and put them under the put you under the Christmas tree. <laughs> you know, it just gets into madness. So, Kevin and I love that. I was sort of would have been happy if that movie had come to fruition. A very funny movie. Conan O'Brien, Robert Smigel, me and Neilan wrote oh. it together. Hans and Franz, the girly man dilemma. Oh, so but anyway, life's good. You know, life's good, man. You're staying creative. You get into. Uh... You get in to have a family and be a real human in a family. That's awesome. Those uh, are important things. Yeah, it's yeah. Cool. My wife and I are just incredibly regular people yeah. doing doing regular things. There's there's an enviable thing when I see people who can really take joy in doing regular things. Just yeah, without being in their head, just going to a matinee, watching a movie. I'm, I'm having popcorn. Man, this is great. I'm putting I'm putting some raisinets in the popcorn. Yeah. You are. Yeah. I'd say to Scott, "What are you going to get?" My brother Scott, movies here. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> and we were big into movies. We liked the movie we'd see it five times. Oh, dude, I remember going to Pink Cadillac. It was it was playing somewhere in my grandmother's town, and I oh. went over there. What year was that? I don't know. Damn, I don't know. But Saw God, it over it and over good. again? Yeah. Oh, I just remember eating so much fucking candy, vomiting in the bathroom, and going back and watching more. <laughs> we go to matinees, but you would go at twelve and come out at five. Oh yeah, Wasn't and it you, crazy you, coming out in the light. It was yeah. so light again outside. Yeah. yeah, and you're in there watching Audie Murphy westerns back to back. You might get a sucker and nurse that, or if you are a big hunk, you just suck on that. You had to last all that time. It was like you could bring a can of beans or fifty cents because if they were having a Salvation Army thing there, yeah. bring some soup. And get in for a five-hour matinee. Yeah. <laughs> Even though we're a generation apart, there's so many things yeah. we have in common. Things it's aren't just, that far off. It just, uh, you know, yeah, maybe we were the original hillbillies of of uh, San Carlos, parents <laughs> from Montana. You know, <laughs> gristle and Dale baked goods, and everyone loved to come to our house. Cock and balls, babe. I'm cock. Oh, I'm, I'm cock. I'm only cock. He's only balls. He's when only you put balls. us together, you got cock only and balls. balls. Yeah. All right, we All should right. mic drop it on that. Full yep, circle. we'll do it there. Dana Carvey, thanks for your time, man. Thanks, Theo. Loved it, enjoyed it. Peace out. Now I'm just floating on the breeze, and I feel I'm falling like these leaves. I must be cornerstone. Oh, but when I reach that ground, I'll share this peace of mind I found. I can feel it in my bones. Hey